On today's episode of Let's Talk FGO, indeed, animation updates early. We're so back. And also, other such things. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk FGO. I'm one of your hosts, Omega. With me, as always, is Lucky. And, well, I don't want to make a, a big deal of shaming the person who uh, talked about us being too quiet. I hope you can't say we're being too quiet right now, because I'm looking at the sound waves. I'm loud right now. Well, I don't want to shame that person. I thank that person. Let us know when things are wrong. Yeah. And generally, people have been saying the show sounds more volumetric now that I stopped normalizing the audio for so long, which I'm sure does make it so it's less likely to damage your ears, but also does make the quiet. I almost said the quieter's quiet. I don't know if that tracks. Anyway, hi. It's Let's Like FGO. So, with that, I thought Omega was going to go somewhere else with that, so I was quiet. I was like, wait, nope, he's not saying anything. So, my bad there. I hope everyone is enjoying Fate Grand Order, a.k.a. Nights of Chills and Thrills. And while we here at Studio Mega like to bring you the latest and FGO related news and memes, we will be talking about current and future events for both JP and Ian versions of the game. So anyone not wanting spoilers should decide if they want tricks or treats. Treats always. Uh, but yes, I'll I'll use that the front part of that intro as a, as a slight segue. So I'm I'm slightly switching things up, chat. Normally, this is where I would uh you know thank all of our patrons by name, and I will say. Hey, the show is brought to you by viewers like you, and does include our Patreon, where I've been assured that the audio-only versions are available and are very nice-sounding. But I'm not going to do the whole spiel here, because common wisdom is to, to you know throw that towards the ender part of the video. So we're going we're gonna to scooch it, but if you don't hear it right now, that's why. That's okay, the patrons know who they are. But that does mean, after intro and any starting bantery, uh, we have to move straight on through to the other side. Not by which I mean I'm gonna check in with everybody's favorite Kohai. Mesh. Senpai! Senpai! Okay. Because that means it's time for our regular pro tippery segment. Wake the fuck up, Senpai. So you also changed that by saying the bits out of order. You can tell that I'm improving because it sounds crappier. No, it's just I'm disrupting my own rhythm. Anyway, I don't have much of a pro tip this week anyway. The one I got for you though is do not forget about your fundraising quests. This is something I myself uh, realized doing some farming, but because there's no map for this event, uh, your fundraising quests are, like, unlocked at the top, so you'll see your little, you know, new quest number, but if you're just doing spamming your free quests, you might not notice them unlock, so do do them. You get lovely things for them. They have stuff and things, like command codes and a crystallized lore, so don't forget them, and that will be the pro tipori. I don't know why, but I wanted to make that rhyme. Eh, sometimes. It's just how it is. It flows. Just like the spice. So, with that, let's go move right on. You alright? Yeah. No, I just... You, you you started doing the segue, and I made some sort of sweeping gesture to go with it, but that means I tapped my index finger against my mic arm. <laughs> so, let us do that segue into our next segment. Records from the Throne, our regular achievement topic. Uh, just uh, some short ones here today. Amanda, what you got? I, I've managed to... Uh, just to say before we went live with the show, uh, Max the Smiles on Dragon Ellie and Huang Fei. Yeah, so you're Fitten. saying you're smile maxing here? Yes. We'll create Excellent. new internet slang. No, I've talked to people about this. Like you can put anything in front of maxing. Hag maxing is is uh the big one. That's just because people are obsessed with hags for some odd reason. People also don't fucking know how to what it is. The eh. as, as as funny as I think, like from like a. I think it was like a news article or something that started the con- you know spreading widely the hag maxing slang. I I know that a lot of people on the internet just say you know hag at, at could be literally any woman, which is like you can't you can't say hag to a woman who's in her mid mid twenties. It's it's not true. But yes, hag max. So small maxing. Uh, Lucky's over here MP maxing. Uh, I got my Ellie small to MP five. I did actually finish the base events, so that is good. Yeah, you're doing better than me on NP copies because I've actually... Well, I have been making sure to spend my AP at least daily farming. Uh, I have not been able to turbo out some of these nodes as, as best. Uh, and you definitely got ahead of me on the farming with uh, some of those days where I was moving. Yeah. But we're working on it. It's a work in progress. But that is all for that. There is no evil this week. It has been defeated. Everyone raise your arms and go Banzai! You don't actually have to do that, but if you do, let me know. Chat, someone give me that gif of that small girl saying the evil has been defeated. Actually, I don't think it's a gif, I think it's just a screen cap. Anyway, that does mean that our next segment is, Did you finish your master missions? 
and I want everybody at home to know that I, I point accusingly at the screen. You can't see it, but I'm doing it. And uh, to complete your master missions this week, straight from my phone to you, uh, you need to defeat three chaotic servants, defeat three neutral servants, and those do both say servants specifically. That is a gift. There we go. Thank you. Uh, you need to defeat 15 enemies with the humanoid trait, 15 enemies with the demonic trait, and then get 15 and then 30 EXP via drops. Because he says drops. And it, actually, it's like a whole long list of every kind of ember you can get. But yeah, it's it's EXP items. Uh, do the event, but also I had a strong sense of deja vu writing these all down. I know they're correct because, like I said, I literally had my phone open after or in between farming runs and scribed them to the note stock. Uh, but it, this feels like eerily similar to Master Missions in the past couple of weeks. And I think we have less than a week left, so I don't know if they'll give us an event-specific set of Master Missions next. I don't know. But uh, yeah, uh, do the event, do some free quests, that's that. Which means, as I stretch my back, put my bones in their correct arrangement, it's time for, speaking of bones, Skelligrams! I think I get to do that voice for one more week. Yes, exactly. And then I have to, I'm contractually obligated to find a different voice for at least ten months. And I better not see any Padoru posting until at least next show. It's November, but I understand. I've lost that fight, but you can't Padoru post until after Halloween. It's against the rules. Anyway, news. First up, serving you up a couple of delightful candy bags of English news. Uh, first, we got Halloween Revival 2024 pickup summon. Basically, some flashback banners. Started the 21st, goes until the 27th. Just a little extra banner yells for you. Uh, they got Hime and they got Vlad banners. Plus, they got old CEs such as, you know, Trick or Treatment and uh, Halloween Little Devil, stuff like that. I do appreciate they keep making sure to rotate those out. So, that's nice to see. Mm -hmm. Also, our, our live chat is having a discussion about uh, what order uh, what order we can uh, present such things. I already have to throw someone inside now because they immediately opposed in one. Yes. I mean, it's it's... It's an ominous one, but yeah, that is unfortunately literally a Padoru gift, so <laughs> I just said, I just said, you can't Padoru post yet. But, speaking of the holiday season, the bigger one, Singularity Repair Campaign 2024 Part 6, uh, so not not quite Road to 7 Part 6, but kind of the preamble of that, you know, announcing what they're going to do probably for the gap for the first couple of weeks in November while we wind down from Halloween and get ready for Kaleya Fairy Cup. Yay! <laughs> Sorry about that. I had a, felt a sudden cough. We're good now. Uh, so this starts the 27th of October and goes through the 30th of November. So you're you're blocked in for the whole month. Now, uh, during this time period, you will have zero AP on all story events up through LB6 until the end of this campaign period. Uh, so this is your, you know, super ultra mega catch up time. We're going to get LB7, I presume still late December because there's a joke about Christmas Day in there. So, you know. Uh, they they have to do the timing or they have to rewrite the script, and I, I don't know if they'll want to do that. But this is a good chance, zero APs, it says, through the end of uh, Lost Belt 6. Uh, just because I think that's how they handle the rotation of the classes. Uh, Assassin dailies are going to be open every day until 11-10, uh, the 10th of 11, that's November. But there are limited time master missions to clear story for access to some Saint Courts, some teapots, some EXPs, etc., etc., Keep those stacked up. Uh, Leyline Stones are going to be back in rotation. I know they just went out of rotation, but they're coming back into rotation. And these new batch of Leyline Stones will be good until the uh, 28th of February. So you have several months. And uh, that does mean if you are needing to work on your catch-up, you will have access to your delightful little story rocks. Uh, we've also got Log into Seven Days for some stuff. A total of six St. Quartz, I believe, along with, again, some more teapots, some more embers, that kind of thing. All the delicious things you like. Uh, uh, one that I found pretty interesting, now we'll get to the, the big blobs at the end, but one that I did find very interesting is a double suck campaign for basically all the three-star servants you get from part one. So, you know, uh, characters like Jaguar Man, Bedivere, etc. They all get uh, double XP during this period, or double suck chance, I think, and maybe double FP. But still, a, a very uh, curious element. Also, actually, yeah, I didn't bring it up out loud, but... Uh, Somebody in Patreon chat says something that reminded me um, that uh, 
Also, uh, the Leyline Stones will be important because we are about to get a new story chapter, so that means we will have a new batch of them to go into uh, LB7 with. Mithlon. That is good to know. Uh, but yeah, so just, just a, I, I think a cute little campaign. But uh, the thing that's, uh, you know, really caught the eye of, of people, a handful, as we're working through, is uh, they have announced that we are doing sprite and NP animation updates for Jean d'Arc and Jean d'Arc Alter early. So to coincide with this Singularity Report campaign, we are getting those updates right now, or at least on the 27th, which is in a couple of days. And uh, yeah, that's pretty neat. I said that in the intro, but this kind of used to be the norm for the English server. I mean, we started with a bunch of animation updates, and uh, as we, you know, trickled through the years, animation updates that hit JP would usually move over here earlier because, like, all the assets and stuff were ready. And I know that it's uh, not been that way for a while, but yeah, uh, it's about a year and a half early, and uh, it's cool. It's neato. Uh, I think uh, they even it even says in the note that... Uh, Jean gets a, uh, regular Jean gets an NP theme now, actually changes the music and stuff, so, uh, that's cool. Good to see. And, uh, you know, good to be back all in our, in our, in our own good old time. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, the, the craziest got something early was, uh, sorry, I forgot for a second, it's not Lucky Bag, it's the Destiny Summon, you know, pick, pick your poison. Um, that being a year early was pretty cool, but it is nice to be back to updates early. And this Singulator Report campaign will come with a pair of Ben Ayers. Uh, you're looking at a uh, Jean Mary Antoinette Saber Giles banner, Saber Gills, and then also a Jolter Xerxelot Caster Giles banner. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, depending on meta and stuff, I know Jolter's not as as cool as she once was, but she's still a very strong single target unit. Uh, I would argue that uh, her banner is probably better because Caster Gills is uh, story locked and. Uh, Xerxelot is a really, really good four-star. Uh, everybody else on the other banner is permanent, and admittedly, uh, while uh, her kit is very interesting and they have given her some buffs, Mary is definitely in a very odd niche for a four-star rider of just being the tankiest. But, uh, yeah, uh, they're gonna run the two banners, and that's real neat too. <sighs> Sorry. Slightly itchy wrist. But we do have a little tiny baby bit of JP news as well. The, uh, what is it? Uh, Feri Sugoroku event is still ongoing, and they've announced the second banner of that. No brand new servants. We're still rolling over here, but it is a re-up, uh, and the banners will last the 23rd until the 6th of November. So, you know, very, very long tail on all this event stuff. But it's, uh, funnily enough, a Melt and Twang Fehu banner. Again, kind of doing that weird synergy with, uh, what the English version is doing right now. But yeah, it's a melt banner. You know, I think everybody probably could have expected this because we're doing a big whole Sakura series thing. But it do also come with a melt NP rank up, which I do believe some people were discussing ahead of time, but it is still important to note. Uh, so uh, melt's NP rank up does the normal damage modifier up, which obviously is very important because she is already a single target quick noble phantasm, so her damage effect is already really high. Uh, but... Uh, the only thing they did to it is they made it so her buff strip and her quick up uh, procs first. So uh, that, I think, is a pretty fair buff to give to a player side unit. Uh, sometimes they remember to give NPCs uh, in new events buffed NPs, but sometimes they don't. Um, and obviously, uh, having buff strip be first as an antagonist is uh, very annoying. But uh, on Melt, it's very good. So uh, now that really... Uh, re-solidifies, I think, her niche very solidly because uh, now, obviously, if your enemies have very annoying buffs you want to get rid of, you can get rid of them first! Right away! And also, her quick amplification does uh, go up. I think I'm I'm assuming since it procs, procced uh, based on overcharge already, it lasted for several turns, but uh, I think, you know, self-steroiding first is obviously much better. So good for Milt. Yay! I think... Actually, honestly... How many of the Sakura series are even single target? Just Welfare BB? The Sakura series? Uh... Yeah. Because Lips AoE, KP's AoE. Yeah. Uh, Summer BB's AoE. Um, uh, BB Dubai is technically support or AoE, right? I don't think she's single target. And I think, um, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure we talked about this last week, uh, Cosmo drops AoE. So yeah, I think Melt is the only single target one. Hmm. But for single target e alter egos, definitely, you know, Melt was already a really strong hitter and had utility with her buff strip on NP. Now that her buff strip on NP happens first and she does even more damage, 
uh, that just brings her right back around to fitting in with everybody else in them high, high damage numbers. But that's our news. Not a whole lot else out of EN, but we are in that phase where, you know, there's less than a week left on the current event. Halloween Rebellion has about five or six days left on the clock. You'd think I remember because I literally had my phone open to check earlier, but I wasn't paying that close attention to the numbers of days remaining. But less than a week, less than a seven day. So we're getting uh, filtering in, but Fairy Sugoroku will last a little bit longer. But the news is done. All right. Well, with that, it is time for this week's Let's Talk FGO Mailbag. The same where we, what you have to say, and comment accordingly. <coughs> oh, Thank you. How do people never sneeze? I never understood this. I swear, I sneeze all the freaking time. Yeah, I don't know. I I have a trick to like catch a sneeze, so it's not so loud. But I don't think I've ever been able to. I just not sneeze. Ugh, like you sneeze, oh. I'm not sneezing, and now I'm like, oh, tip of my nose is itchy. I just saw the Halloween portal, so I'm putting Ark in time out now. So, 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 so. Let me refresh our page here. We have seven, seven lovely comments, and we will get through them all. Beginning right, meow. Our uh, first one comes from Monster Girl Aficionado, who says, Dear Lucky Omega, no question this week, just sending you good vibes and wishing you well. Keep up the great work. Your shows are one of the highlights of my week. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you enjoyed them, and I hope you will continue to enjoy them. But, with nothing more to say there, we shall move swiftly on. And our next one comes from, I have come from 2021. Now, if only if it was like the year 2011 or 2001, I'd be very impressed. Now I'm a slightly concerned. They say, hi, Lucky Omega. I was an avid listener back in 2020, 2021, but took an FGO hiatus, but recently picked up FGO again this month after watching the Heaven's Feel movie. It's a very good movie. I highly recommend it to anybody. Awesome to see you guys are still running the weekly show. Have been loving it. Question. I stopped playing around the uh, release of LB3. It feels like so much has changed. I'm trying to catch up. What is the one biggest change in the last three years of FGO that I should know about mechanics, medics, or stories, etc.? Not story spoilers, I just finished LB4. Uh, thank you both, and cheers. Oh, what is the biggest change? Yeah, let's see. About about three years. I mean, they thankfully, they put a time frame. They they, they dropped out right around LB3, so... Uh, I mean, append skills have been added since then, which can be pretty crazy, because you can get that, you know, mana loading for everybody starts to 20%, up to 20%. Their skills, you still well, to level them. Uh, past three years? That means we they have not seen the brand new class sweeping the nation yeah that was the other thing i was thinking about when uh when uh, i read this comment that got posted like basically yeah i guess because they would have because yeah castoria was the anniversary after that i think right i believe so. so yeah uh basically you've missed out uh my friend on a lot of uh fgo meta discourse you know you left just as double scotty system became the the meme uh then caster uh, Artoria came out, and uh, you know, yeah, they. W- I mean, they would have they would have heard of her, but there's no guarantee because they stopped playing. They wouldn't have been able to play with her at least. So like, but Castoria made arts looping like really big and consistent. Uh, and then between uh Koyanskaya of Light and uh Oberon, who's out in the LB6 block, uh, Buster really went through a big revolution. So I think like honestly. Like, fundamentally, I don't think it's too huge a deal which flavor you want to go through, but uh, know now that, like, all of the card types have been, like, basically overhauled. Oh, and actually, uh, literally Quick was overhauled. That's another thing I forgot about that happened in the past three years. Um, uh, They changed it so that if you start with a Quick card, it now gives you free crit percentage. And yes, if you string a Quick, an Arts, and a Buster together, you get a Mighty Chain, which gives you all three effects. Uh, Mechanics-wise, that's probably the big one. <laughs> Sorry. Pedro Dredd just it just said triple Scotty quick farm and it was just like, oh my god. That's right. We're technically we're in you could have a lot of Scotties. Thanks, Summer Scotty. Hmm. I'm now stroking my beard. And I do have a little bit of a little bit of stubble because uh complete tangent but slight moving related story. Uh we don't have a bathroom mirror in the new place yet. Oh no. So I'm a little I'm a little worried to 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 shave by feel. Because my I don't think my Okay, no, no, my I had to double check. My current phone does have a front facing camera, so if it gets too long I may have to do that. Shave you a selfie cam. Anyway, three years of FGO. Biggest deal. That's right, we can go all the way to level one twenty, that's another one. Uh I will warn you, that's gonna take you a fuck ton of embers. 
Uh, I mean, hopefully, if they've been playing, they've been getting, like, uh, login rewards and stuff, so hopefully they've noticed that we have five-star embers now, but I believe that was a change that was in the last uh, three years. Hmm. Unfortunately, Lucky does not control the remember, so I have no idea what to really say. All I can really say is LB6 is going to be a hell of a time for you. Yeah, have fun. So- that'll, be, uh, that'll be related to a question I think we got later. Um, I'll do my, uh, my usual call to action in the, uh, for, for comments on the video. Uh, hey! If you're listening to this part right now, go in the comments on YouTube and you say what uh, you think the, like, the most important thing, mechanics, meta, and servant-wise, not story stuff, uh, happened in the past three years of FGO. If you can even remember what order three years happened in. So, with that, we shall move swiftly on. Or not so swiftly. Uh, this next one comes from the man who has listened to 100 hours of Left Talk FGO in September and about 80 hours in October. Jeez. They say... Dear Lucky and Omega, first off, I wanted to thank you for taking my question a few weeks ago. I wanted to thank you the following week, but between work and social situations, I couldn't get a comment on. I'm curious what the question was three weeks ago, but uh, like I said, it, was, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, also, it, I don't remember exactly what they what they had to ask either, but I remember that it's the one that began with uh, listening to 100 hours in, in September. <laughs> ah. But I wanted to thank you for all the consistent and amazing content ever since the game launched in 2017. We have been doing this show weekly, like, like month two, basically. Yeah. Go us. Uh, cool. That was about the time I was getting out of college and started my career in tax accounting. I'm not going to say you guys saved my life or anything dramatic like that, but you guys kept me sane for the majority of my time starting off in my adult life. Thank you again for being so awesome. Well, thank you for being here all that time. Listen, I just, I just spend one day and I spend a few hours just saying whatever's on my mind. It's like, it is you guys that make this keep happening. So thank you. Uh, as for my question, I am currently in LB6, oh boy, and for reasons that would take way too long to explain in this post, I'm going to get an alt account and work all the way to LB6 on it before continuing on my main. As I said, long story. I bet. I still want to know. I've been rushing through content in the last three weeks, gotten about halfway through LB2, but finding myself struggling with some of the content where I can't use my mains, funny vamp to just clear out everything. Lock story uh, support. Lock support servant missions. My question is, do you have any recommendations for the servants coming up in the Singularity Repair event slash banner that would help me with the content? My servants right now include Waver, Herc, Francis Drink, Zenobia, and most FP servants. Uh, thank you once again, and sorry for the length of this post. Well, you got a Herc and you got a Waver. Those, still very good. Uh, Herc is still known for being able to do decent amount of damage and being nigh unkillable, if, especially if you can get his Bond CE and have the proper CE set up. Yeah. And Waver and, is sti- the, you know, the neutral buffer. Uh, so going there. Oh, what are we talking about here with the Singularity Repair? Thing? Well, I mean, the it might be a little on the nose, but the, the Singularity Repair campaign, the Summon Banner, it's about to start in a couple of days uh, from when we're recording this. The John and Jolter, uh, especially with all her buffs, uh, John Stahl will still get you through a lot of bullshit. Mm-hmm. She gives you one turn of invol and a debuff clear if you do her rank up. And uh, as was brought up in the in the live chat as well, uh, Jolter is still like top three single target damage servants. So like, if you need more firepower, Jolter is definitely worth investing in. And that banner that Jolter is on does also have Berserker Lance a lot for some of your like gnarly AOE Berserker clears. So that that's one right away that may be looking into. I'm God. We used to actually do. We still have a a pin in our main blob about upcoming events. Oh, we do have the event compendium. Is this still updated? I think I don't know if this covers every banner though. But yeah, there's that. I think is a big one. Uh, I believe there is. I mean, if you're in LB6, you know about her. But I believe that there should be a Morgan and Fairy Knights banner upcoming for uh uh Caldea Fairy Cup. Uh, for also speaking for AOE Berserkers, Morgan is uh also hella strong. Obviously, as you say, you have uh have some some complex things to to go through on this but if you can you can swing a a a morgan banner oh is it like a pre sorry i may be getting a psychic information that uh it's okay it's the so the morgan banner is the pre-release for fairy cup all right so that should be about a week after halloween unless it's also part of the clear campaign i don't know or the road to seven campaign there's a lot of campaigns and obviously there'll be some kind of series of uh limited servant summon banners around thanksgiving that will probably include... Have we had our uh, once-a-quarter Gilgamesh banner already? I also feel like Skahak is usually in there some. She's a very s- strong single-target uh, fighter as well. 
I don't know. We probably our our Gill Accord is probably coming up with whatever they're going to do for the Thanksgiving banners. Yeah. Well, yeah. This this person just said that they're they're working on an uh an alt before they progress to past where they are at in six for their own convoluted reasons. I don't know what the character limit is in a YouTube comment, but feel free to comment uh, after the fact in in the video comments as well if you want to let us know the story. Just even if it is long, but ha- having a diverse roster in general is good. But if they're just trying to get an alt to push up through through to LV six, I mean, like like you said, you got Weaver, you got Herc. That's pretty good. Uh, keep your eye out for Morgan. Jolt is really good for single targets. Uh, we genuinely do not know what servants they put up for Thanksgiving. Like we like to guess, you know, usually Gil, usually Skahawk. But other than that, man, I don't know. But I think that is enough on that, and we shall move swiftly on. Thank you very much. And this next one comes from the Tire King, who finally got his shiny green tea Pokemon with a mark, and in its, its rare form. I have no idea what this means, man. Hey guys, with LB7 coming up soonish, what are your favorite moments from part two and anything you are looking forward to in LB7? Anyway, that's it for me. Send good vibes your way. Wah, 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 wah. And hope you have a great evening. Favorite thing from part two? Morgan Vargas. That's it. That's all I have to say. That's a pretty solid one. Sorry, it's just, you know, my I started, you know, rolling my brain Rolodex, and there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff Um, to talk about in part two. But, like, the my my brain instantly started playing the opening notes to uh the final battle theme with uh Oberon from LB6, and I'm just like, yeah, that's probably it. Listen, all of LB6 is amazing. Yeah. Uh, LB6 was, was such a moment, and the Climax is so phenomenal. The multiple climaxes. Ooh. At some point, I'm probably just going to lay in bed and just replay all of LB6. Just be like, mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been God. thinking about about rereading it for, honestly, several months now. But it's one of those things of like, when do I have time? I guess I have been sitting in bed and reading more. Maybe I do have time now. I'm sure I'll get that itch for sure when I actually do start working on the, the best of compilations. Yes, it will probably be multiple ones. <laughs> yeah, I'll be in bed for a week. It feels like, God, 26 sections, right? Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. And they're dense. And it's only counting numbered, too. There's fucking side side stories and intercools. But yeah, as for looking forward to 7, um, another thing I should say. I don't exactly know what's going to happen in LB7, so I can't really say either. Yeah, like I, I said, I know some things, but I don't understand all things. And I want to keep it that way. It's it's been a couple of years since it came out, and like I I as usual I have some sideshow vibes, you know. Like it, it's it's like you know you're on the road, you drive by something, you crane your neck a little to see, but you don't stop, you know. That's kind of how we usually are with with story spoilers. So I'm like I have some vague inklings about some things. Um, like for instance, I know that uh, I believe it's with the second part, but you know, LB7 is is uh, the the Tanneresh costume. And I'm just like, well, I really want to see like how that sort of thing comes up with a lot of these servants and characters, you know. But also, I'm like, man, I don't even know. I do at least feel like I'm obviously I'm very interested to see for myself, and I think there are a lot of very interesting things that'll happen in it, especially because it will be split up over a couple of parts. But we should get our parts closer together, just like with uh, LB6. But like, I don't, I don't feel like Seven had quite the same response as Six, like. Lost Belt 6, Avalon the Fae is, like, a fandom moment. Like, I feel like it's one of those things where, like, wh- when you're talking to a Fate fan, you got you know, you gotta ask him, like, oh, how did you feel about LB6? Where were you? What were you doing? You know? Whereas 7 doesn't have quite this kind of, like, upper level. So, I'm, I'm, I am kind of curious to see, you know, that there, what, what are exactly our, our interplay is with all of our guys and dudes and, and what we got going on. I'm sure it'll be super interesting. I'm just, just, you know, I'm here for new story content, baby. Actually, that was a un- slightly unrelated, but a good question of asking. When's the release for Hollow Ataraxia? When did they say they're doing that? Didn't they say fall this year? Yeah, Trump's Climax was the... I'm trying to remember. I think we talked about this, but we like... We're going to talk about that, right? In LB7? Uh, we're not just going to jump ahead. We, we got to talk about what was going on in the end of Trom, right? Please? My brain hurts. I'm still confused. Okay, thank God. Okay, we pick right up where we left off. Good. <laughs> Fucking hell of a cliffhanger. Anyway, yeah, that's a good thing to look forward to with 7. I'm going to resolve that cliffhanger. Okie dokie! So, we move on. This next one comes from Moth to Grill, a fish to a natto. But they say, hello, Omega Mon and Chansey Regenerator plus Leftover plus 252 HP plus 130 death 
plus 126 special death. What? Chat, why would you assign Lucky a Pokemon meme? Why do you do this to me? But also, I mean, I guess it's a compliment. They just, like, that's that's a that's an HP tank setup for Chansey. That's the wall, baby. But why Lucky? What did I do? Be indestructible? I don't know. I don't know if I'm indestructible. <laughs> Sorry. Somebody in chat. <laughs> the, the, the the stronger Pokemon fans in our in our Patreon live chat reacted very strongly to that quote. <laughs> they did. <laughs> I don't know if I'm being insulted or complimented here. Maybe both? Insultimented. Complimented. <laughs> <laughs> Chad is going a little wild over this. I think my favorite line about this is like, Lucky, I say they have just said it made you the filthiest tank set up ever. Apparently, Lucky's a dirty boy. <laughs> anyway, this person goes on to say, My question is, Jow, do you guys feel about the event situation in FGO? Do you think FGO hiss the right amount of events, or would you like if it had a constant stream of events akin to Hoyo games? Have a great weekend, and thank you your thank your time. Yes, time, thank you. Thank you for being here and being perfectly measured. 60 seconds every minute. Mm, I love it. <laughs> Boy, I you do see love over the there? You see over there in fucking, like, like, in, like, in Earth 2? Nah, they got, like, fucking 58 to 63 seconds per minute. Their shit's all over the fucking place. Nah, Earth time? Mm, perfect. Thank you, time. Boy, I do love the confluence of space and time being the same thing. Thanks for uh, existing in a linear fashion and not breaking down causality so that events precede causes. Also, yes, Chad, in case you couldn't guess, people at home, I posted the minor spelling mistake gif. Uh, double thanks on that comment, yeah, not only for sending it in, but also you sparked joy. Uh, as for the question, FGO's events, um, I mean, honestly, I I don't think I'm a big fan of, of how Hoyo does their constant string of events. Like, I feel like Hoyoverse games are trying to, like, sucker you in through the ultimate FOMO of just you have to keep playing them because they basically never add a permanent unit. So it's all limited guys and limited events all the time. Obviously, they do still have big story updates that are static, but you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like FGO has downtime. Yeah, honestly, I, I need downtime. When, like, if I start up a new game and they're just doing events back to back to fucking back, and then it's really hard for me to catch up on um on main story. I'm actually having this pro this problem with uh Snowbreak because I like Snowbreak. I I like it. The gameplay of it isn't the bestest, but like I enjoy I enjoy the wife is in it. Like I I truly do. But um since they like I've been playing it for like oh three months right now, and they've had an event going the entire time. So I'm still like out of. I'm still in like chapter four out of twelve of the main story, and they just keep pushing forward and forward. I'm like, no, stop! I need to catch up. Just give me two weeks. I'll do it. I swear. No, don't hit me with the event paddle again, mommy. And, and, and I will say it's kind of weird because, like, I, I think there were several gotcha games that have like crashed and burned because they were trying to like pick up the pace well, to catch up. Well, some of them do that. I remember that. This was the problem I think a lot of people had with the Madoka uh, Magica uh, Ian version. Yeah. Is that they would be actually running multiple events at once. And you're just like, bruh, I have not gotten a tentacle of waifus in AL yet. I have not booted up. Lucky's been Lucky's been having a day. Yeah, and I will agree with chat. brought up a comment that I, I do think that the, the taste for these gacha games has changed so that it is like a thing of like, you, you want an, some sort of event running all the time. And I will say, I, technically, FGO does actually not have a lot of dead weeks. It's just that they pace their events out so that, especially now that they've uh, lowered the amount of reruns and they've made it so most events last three weeks, um, you have a lot of time to do the core event and get the banners and stuff. And even when we're having a down week, technically, there's usually something going on like a dedicated, you know, zero AP main story catch up. Or, you know, support campaigns, um, you know, adding the recollection quests as well, which are, you know, the super recollection quests are, like, very, very high-end content. So, like, FGO doesn't usually have, like, technically literal dead weeks anymore. Definitely we did have some. Um, but, you know, there's definitely that moment of, like, where I think FGO understands after they've been around for so long that, like, the, like their primary appeal definitely is a lot in the main story writing and that's where a lot of like their biggest hits are so they want to make sure that people have the opportunity to 
catch up, enjoy it, and hit those, you know, breaks when they do limited time events. Uh, yes, I do think there's an observation there that, like, Azure Lane is very funny in that they did have a normal-ass main story that was, like, vaguely recreating World War II naval battles, but with waifus. Um, and then they just gave up on it. <laughs> they just stopped doing story that way for, like, forever, and I don't think they do any story releases that way anymore. It is now just all through, uh, event stuff, and there are some events which are more story-focused than others. But, like, you know, talking about older games, you know, Girls Frontline and, uh, Arknights were still that style, where there are, you know, main story content drops, and they have limited time events and maps. Uh, Genshin, I believe, is, is the same way. I don't think I was playing Genshin long enough to actually get, a, like, a major story update, but, like, they... They have new regions that are added to their map, which constitute, you know, normal story updates, and then they also have other stuff interspersed in there. I assume Honkai Star Rail is the same, because it is, like, you know, a, a, a turn-based RPG. This is actually funny, having this discussion about, like, Hoyo design phase. Uh, this happened a little bit in the uh, the before times for uh, Fail Betrayal this week. Uh, Miax and Vesper were talking about, about Hoyo and stuff for unrelated reasons, but, like... I keep wanting to, like, get in and, and actually, like, play Honkai Star Rail to see what the gameplay is like, because that does seem to be really good, but, you know, to catch me in a way that, like, Genshin kind of lost me with just how, I guess, repetitive it was, like, in the early phases, it was just like, okay, cool, you cleared all the story quests, guess you're just, you know, gliding and hitting slimes, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Zenless also, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, where it lost me was just, like, it just felt so much busy work, you know? Like, it's really cool that I can actually, like, leave my VHS shop and go across the street to the arcade. And they do have fast travel nodes, but it's like, is this really necessary? I feel like they just added a lot of, like, very pretty-looking fluff to try and make you go, oh, this is cool. And then, you know, when you're playing it, it's just like, eh, you just kind of do the same stuff over and over again. Which a lot of gotcha games are like, but some of them do have tight gameplay loops. So, like, the... Everybody, I feel like, says that Honkai's gameplay is actually, like, really good if you like turn-based RPGs, so I'm like, someday I'll have to remember to give it a try. I'll just have to, you know, realize that I'll never ever get any of the units I want because I've missed all the limited banners. Oops. But yeah, so like I said, I I like how FGO does things. It's kind of a, a, a relic, but, like, that's another thing, it's like, separately. Um, FGO is, like, constantly rerunning servant banners, like... They go crazy out of their way to get people back in the in the loop, you know? Like literally, I'm pretty sure isn't isn't Huang permanent? Yes. Yeah, so like they don't have to give him a raid up, but in JP, they decided to tuck him in with Melt for a raid up, I think because, you know, they reminded like, oh yeah, it's been like two years since he came out. So like it's interesting, you know, where like FGO's philosophy is, well, if you just wait out long enough we've got a lucky bag or we've got a rerun banner. You can catch your opportunity. You need a lot of those opportunities because, you know, there's, there's the, the pity system is kind of, uh, you know, large, even though they are working on improving it and, and stuff like that. But they, they really give you the a lot of opportunities to get in there. I still don't know. You know chat literally trying to sell me like, oh, we just had a huge rerun patch with a lot of little top units. And I'm like, ah, I could, but I got other stuff I need to do. I've just, I've just now gotten all my shelv shelving units uh, back so like I can finally finish unboxing all of my games and other media and put them up so I can finally recover my disc of P3R. We can get back on that. But yeah, uh, you play a lot more gotcha games than I do, Lucky. What, what do you think about like how FGO does events? I know you've just said you know you feel like you need some downtime, but like com compared to some other stuff you do, what, you know what do you, what do you think? Well, I think I like I prefer like having the three week events now because generally an event's usually done like everything's come out. Like, after a week. Generally, if, you, if you're if you playing the event from day one and you're playing FGO a decent amount of time, you'll usually be done with said events after a week. That means you got two weeks to work on things that you want to do. And if you are hardcore farming, you can probably clear out that, that um, shut the event shop between, you know, um, between week one and week two. Or no, rather, week two and week three, I should say. And then you have the third week where you don't actually have to deal with the events. So you can go um, do, take care of other things and not feel bad. Uh, the thing that I don't like about some events, especially when they run back to back, is how they try to keep you hooked into that one event the entire time for whatever reason, whether it be um, 
like whatever's in the shop or like, you know, time locks or maybe they don't actually give you enough time in the event. So you have to be hyper focused on that event. I think FGO does a good way of balancing. They give you plenty of time. They don't and it and even though they want you playing every day, it doesn't actually demand all of your time. Like, shoot, even at, like, 100, and, um, like, I think I'm a lo- lo- level, uh, excuse me, I'm a level 155 in FGO right now, so I think I only got, like, 140 AP. That's only, if I'm not using apples, that's only three runs of anything, baby. And if I, pro- and if I pull out my, if I pull out my, um, my uh, three-turn setup, you know, that's three turns, I've run nine turns, I'm fucking done for the day. And so things change when you start involving apples and whatnot, and you're more likely to involve said apples at the beginning of the events when you're trying to get done, but things go on, nah. It's easy peasy lemon squeezy. Get out of here. It's fucking breezy. I just came up with that. I'm proud of that. I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. So, no, I like how FGO does their events now. And I hopefully we keep on doing this. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, uh, the, I, I understand that, like, shareholders probably don't want to do it FGO's way all the time because, like, actually, no, well, I don't know. I mean, like, just as like I said, FGO is usually running a banner with a limited servant because they've been going for so long. They have such a huge backlog, you know. Well, it's not necessarily a shareholder thing, I want to say, with events. I have seen this in a lot of, um, like, live service games and whatnot. Um, if a game is not running some sort of event, some sort of hook to keep people invested in game, people will leave in droves because they will just say, no, there's nothing to do. Because a lot of people will burn themselves out getting to said content, do it as quickly as they can, and then, you know, start screaming, where's the where's the next event? What am I supposed to do now? So I think it's just one of those things of um like the constant event cycle, it, I think it's something that's more based off of uh, playing habits of uh, the habits of uh players rather than necessarily uh stockholders. Yes. It's and like I said, I that's why I even call myself like I'm not even sure that like because F- FGO's profit, you know, kind of uh, waxes and wanes based on their banners, but obviously when they do have a new limited servant, they, you know, make sure to, to punch up to the top. But yeah, it is it is more about eyeballs and engagement, which obviously with so many free-to-play games out there, and also, uh, just as fair and valid, so many old games that are cheap that you can buy and play, you know? Who needs new content when you've got old content? But yeah, there's definitely a thing of like, I mean, like, honestly, this is a super complete aside, but I know a lot of people have tried to make it a thing about, like, the design or the aesthetics or whatever, but, like, uh, I think genuinely the reason why Concord failed was because it wanted a $40 asking price. And also, as the the game's, like, character appeal wasn't as cutting as they thought it was. Like, it, it not being free to play meant that even if your audience would casually try it they wouldn't because they needed to cough up forty dollars up front as opposed to like oh i don't know fortnite overwatch 2 uh which overwatch already made the jump to free to play in their own time that uh, i purchased the original edition of of overwatch i have a physical disc for that because that was that game is so old you had to buy it and then they eventually decided nah free to play and then they decided the problem with a free to play game is nah you have to play overwatch 2 now fuck you games are wild but yeah it's it it's about engagement habits, but I do think that FGO's way of doing that, like I said, is healthier, where, like, technically, even if the event a week is, you know, a nothing event, some people are still catching up, some people may have stuff to do, and so can take advantage of it, but other people are just like, well, when FGO does something I, you know, want to sink my time in, I'll sink my time into FGO. <sighs> Big stretch for me. So, with that, I think we can call that one uh, open and shut, and move swiftly on to the next one. This next one comes from The Smuggler, who says, Hey guys, just checking in to say have a good day. Well, fuck you. I'm trying to figure out this. Is it L.A. Smugger? Yeah, is I don't. La, is it for Laplace? Yes, that probably is. It probably is a Laplace Darkness Evo. I, I know this person. Son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I see so many VTubers on my Twitter feed. I'm not even subscribed to any VTubers. That and Bernice Dancing. Oh that my one god! Did indeed, really spread. They'll never know it, but I I gave the smuggling a a a, a sixty second timeout for smug. <laughs> oh, I'm sick of seeing Bernice. <laughs> well, don't look at Patreon chat for a little bit. God, guys. Uh, All right, that's it. 
<laughs> oh shit, he's getting his mallet. I'm getting me mallets. I mean, I think that the Zenless uh, animation team is fucking working their heart out, but they're also possibly working too hard. They don't need to work that hard. They could relax a little. <laughs> that's Now that's an emote. I love that this emote is just called Cat Gun. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find this shit? That's great. No, it's all timeouts. <laughs> I don't know, probably like 60 <laughs> seconds. They'll be back. They know what they did. <laughs> By the way, I would like to remind everybody, uh, you you don't have to be at the high patron level to to listen to the show live to see all this. Any any patron can access the patron chat of our Discord where you can see this chaos unfold. Why do these people tempt me? Why? Why do they test me? I mean, I've got to be honest, I, I'm pretty sure they were tabulating and loading the first couple gifts at least, before you said, I don't want to see it. But then it happened, and I was just like, well, don't look. It's there. I do want to shout out Ark for um, bringing back uh, some of the unhinged shit I say. Um, I'll just read it here, here. It's me going, no, I need Lucky Bonk emotes, and I'm going to name it something ridiculous like, if Violent wasn't the answer, I'm not using enough of it. I'm going to figure it out. It's just going to be a tear bit holding a bloody bat. You all die. A tear with a bat emote would go pretty hard. Uh... So also, Chad, I just got to let you know. I typed in, I started typing in colon oppressed just to see what would happen. I w- typed OPP and um, I just had to stop because of what emotes Discord offers me when you start typing colon OPP. Uh, we've got champagne, cricket. Don't get that one at all. Uh, floppy disk, shopping bags, shopping cart, and ta-da, which is the, uh, like, party popper emote. And I'm just like, one, why are these emotes? Why are these emojis? But two, also, cricket? And not even a cricket bat. I'm, I'm... <laughs> sure this is quite nice. Well, this is one I got from the Final Fantasy uh, 14 uh, hunts Discord I'm, I'm in. I will give this one to you. Sloppy! Ah, <laughs> uh, that's real good. <laughs> Shit, man! I gotta get nitro sometime so I can sloppy. Uh, all right, enough of this tomfoolery and chicanery. Let us move on to last but not least, Agent Four One Eight, who says, "Hello, Lucky Omega. Have a good weekend, y'all. Thank you. Thank you very much." Yeah. By the way, I put those fuckers in the timeout for five minutes. That's how mad I was. Oh, wow, it got cooked. Sorry, I've just opened up the default emotes once again, and I'm just like, "Wow, there's a lot of different hands we can do now." Uh, you could do metal horns. You can do, you know, all kinds of hand-related stuff. There's there's fists facing directions, so you can probably fist bump. I don't know, man. Anyway, thank you very much for your mailbag, as always, everybody. Time And your deep and thoughtful questions have brought us over one hour on the mission clock. Hooray. That means that it's time to move into Caldea Free Talk. We have one item on the docket for today in the Free Talk. Well, technically two, but I don't know if I usually count Fanservant Friday as part of the free talk block. That might be its own thing. I don't know about the structure. Anyway, yes, you will do FSF today. I'm prepped. But before that, we have Halloween final thoughts. Halloween Rebellion, specifically. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, you finished the, the core story. I did. What do you think? I liked it. I don't think it was like necessarily like overly amazing or anything, but it was entertaining, and I find that to be the most important bit. Yes. It I made me that. laugh. Yeah, that's that's I think about where where my opinion is as well. It's not like the you know the deepest or most hard hitting, um, but it had some some good gags, some good goofs. It's like like all throughout it, they really didn't let up on the humor, and I think that's like making the um, the recruitment ad and having Sancho, you know, you being fired from his job. I was like, oh my god, that's great. Just the freaking the um, endless alcohol falls. Constantly being brought up. I didn't actually know that was going to be a plot point later. I thought it was just cool, but that's how those things work. Yeah. Yeah, I I I feel like some more of the like story story bits um like they probably would have like hit harder to me if I was more familiar with the water margin. Uh but I'm not. So, you know, like the reveal at the end of it just being like a bunch of guys, you know, the six traders or whatever, I'm just like, okay, but the the humor was still very strong uh, throughout. All right, now I'm gonna everything. time out you for ten minutes. Go play more metaphor. We're all having a lot of fun here. Uh, sorry, I just placed my thought for a second. Let me, re- let me rewind the train. Uh, but yeah, like I said, the the actual like story beats of the plot, you know, went over my head kind of. 
but the humor was all very good and very endearing. And I think they did, as usual, a good job of pitching all the characters that are involved. Um, I think they did a very, you know, uh, a decent job of making everybody feel involved. You know, we got uh, more, you know, Boudicca and Matahari action than we've gotten in, I feel like, years out of this event. It's true. I love them both. Uh, excellent side gags for characters we've even still gotten decent amounts of, like Robin. Robin Hood, like, almost always showing up at Halloween, but still very good showing here. Blackbeard notes are very good. Stuff like that. Uh, Amakusa and Lobo forced to hang out for a little bit, you know, very fun little stuff. So, you know, I like a lot of that. I think we had decent production value. Uh, and, like, honestly, I don't know how to feel about, like, the final, like, boss fight part. Like, I think it was kind of funny of them to go, like, you know, uh, you know, the unit setup was, was, like, uh, Sorry, I'm blanking on her name right now. Uh, it was Chin Lang Yu. Um, I can only think of two two clubs. Hu Yan Zhou. There we go. Like my brain has to like write write the rest of the name out. Um, it, it was it was Hu Yan, and then you know obviously all the kids because they didn't drink any alcohol. I was just like, okay, that's funny. And then the boss basically destroys itself, and I'm just like, then they turned that into a gag in the fall up. They were like, that was it. We're done. So, uh, but I'm like, it it it, it is still. A weird anticlimax, but it's okay because, you know, the much like you would expect from a Halloween event, the actual climax is like everybody being like, ah, and the friends we made along the way. I think this was a good uh, second outing for characters like uh, uh, Zenobia and Jacques, you know? Yeah. So all in all, like really real good character writing, real good gags. A- and I think the most, like from just a pure plot construction part, the very interesting idea of having two masters, you know, like, like mm-hmm. having us be split up, one of us, us, and then one of us, the pumpkin head. Uh, like that was that was neato, uh, and I do think it was very interesting that they they played around a lot with like making your dialogue choices matter, like you know doing different like, fights, picking side you on, who you go yeah. with. No, I like that. Yeah, that was that was good. I hope we get we continue to get more of that in in future stuff. So all in all, very very positive. Yes, a solid Halloween, and of course Nine Dragon Ellie is great. She's adorable. She is adorable. I love her in the shop. Her stick is a dragon. Dragon stick. But, but unfortunately, I, I don't I think I have too much to actually say on the event overall, except it was entertaining, it was funny, I liked all the characters, the gangs were good, and it wasn't too much of a pain in the dick overall, so. Yeah. yeah. The pain in the butt part is the uh, the farming for some of them. I'm still trying to work out a, a, a team comp to do some of that stuff. But that's, I, part of it may just be that I have always had terrible luck rolling on <laughs> Halloween banners. So my comps are a little, a little skew whiffed. Also, I think I just have bad card luck. Like hypothetically, I think not the like ninety double plus, but the node before that, I could three turn that with like uh uh God, I'm I don't know why, but my brain doesn't want to do names today. Um, summer not shooting shit. Why am I really bad at this all of a sudden? I'm gonna drink my water and chat will hopefully answer this for me. Who are we trying to think about here? Uh, big dragon lady. It's not not Ibuki? Shijin, the other one. Abuki? Yes, Abuki, thank you. I could also do Masashi, but no Abuki. Um technically I could three turn the ninety plus node with Ibuki if I could get face cards. Like, if I could get Ibuki to have like two face cards, God help me a brave chain, um, in that that middle one, I'd be great. No, I'm running double Castoria and I just get five Castoria cards, even though I used <laughs> like two Castoria cards in the last command hand, and I'm just like, how? This is why I can't beat a fucking run in. Bel- I haven't beat a run in Bellatro in like a, a week. Why do you hate me, cards? But yeah, so I'm like my my farming setups are all over the place. But yeah, story was was pretty good. And like I said, I feel like uh, yeah, but then I don't have a Mystic Code battery if I need it. Actually, wait, no. Uh, the shuffle is on the battery, isn't it? Is that Mage's Association? My Mage's Association is in maxed forever, so I try not to use it because then I'm just wasting Mystic Code EXP because it is max level, and those things are a pain in the ass to level. But yeah, we don't have like a shuffle two. Oh, I can do the twenty percent. I can try that. I I just it's because it's not uh it's not like uh Buntoria's move where it removes command cards. I'm just worried about them handing me the se- exact same fucking cards where it's like, well, that doesn't help. I, I, I ask both of you to assume I'm at the orange and purple stakes. No, I just told you I haven't cleared a Bellatro run in like two weeks. I think by now I'm still stuck in like clearing a run with basic decks. They always find some way to fuck me when I'm going for the pulls. That's why I just need to get my dream set up where I do nothing but get uh go all in on just having uh the jokers and the planet cards to upgrade two pairs. 
I mean, I feel like I know the trick because I have cleared Balachar runs. The trick is you have to remember to actually take planet cards so your fucking poker hands scale. But the rest of it is just making sure you have a Joker that does something. But I'm not here to talk about Bellatro. Uh We're here to wrap up talking about Howling Final Thoughts, which I think we have collecting pretty good. Let us know your overall thoughts on the event in the commentos below. Sorry, I was rolling my neck a little. Blub. And that does mean that it's time to finally catch up on some stuff, uh, and I will think for November we'll be back to a new Fancy Friday Friday poll. Remember, support us on Patreon. Five and up. Polls. Like Fancy Friday Friday. Uh, but we're going to finally catch up on technically September's run. We've missed the spooky run, but that's okay because I honestly, uh, I don't have like four spooky servants to throw in the pot anyway, so I wouldn't have been able to produce a satisfactory theme. But uh, what did win, sorry, I just acts like typed out a whole strat for Bellatro and I'm like, that's, I mean, that's the most generic strat ever. Yes, you want, you know, you want to get chips, you want to get multis, and then you get something that gets your strat and, you know, whatever. But it's, the the thing is you need to get those jokers. And while obviously you can shape a roguelike run to matter if you get, you know, something that's like, oh, you get times four multi if you do a flush. Uh, it's like, d- also, it, sometimes that doesn't help. Like, okay, cool, I, I'm forced to spec into, to, to you know, three of a kind. Well, what if I don't get threes of a kind? Then you just die. Anyway, anyway, two months ago, well, about a month ago now, you know, late September, uh, the patrons voted for Ned Kelly to win Australia's Robin Hood. And on the poll, I did originally list, and I did originally intend to put these notes together for uh, Berserker, because I think that kind of originally fit, you know, the famous... Uh, Kelly Gang armor suit better. But honestly, when I was rewriting these notes out and, and revising them earlier today, uh, I decided to put him back in Archer because I did not realize quite how much, but like every source I went to, everywhere you go, everybody was like, ah, Ned Kelly and the Kelly Gang, Australia's Robin Hood. So I, I decided to put him back in Archer because like everywhere I went was out here making comparisons to, to the classic Robin Hood. And I'm like, Okay, well, it's it's fate, so we have to make them the same class so that they line up like that. Uh, if you don't happen to know about Ned Kelly, one, you're probably not Australian, uh, nor have you sat through uh, one of uh, Lost Favorite's movie. Uh, which movie about Ned Kelly, I won't tell you, uh, is Lost Favorite, because there's so many. Uh, and actually, like I said, I want to talk about talking about like how famous Ned Kelly is. Like, I think, actually, uh, Ned is probably a pretty good pick for a possible servant. Uh, again, I don't know how much the Japanese people know about Ned Kelly, but they're closer to uh, Australia than most, and we have Wild West servants, and Ned Kelly is basically a Wild West of Australia's guy. Uh, full name Edward Kelly. He was born in uh, 1854. He lived to age 25 and died in 1880. So well before uh, the typical fate cutoff of mystery, he was a bush ranger and an outlaw uh, in the Victoria region of Australia. Uh, you have probably seen some uh, famous images about him, but he's really well known for the beard. Uh, keep in mind, those of you seeing this beard, uh, he was forced to go on the run and live out in the Australian bush for a while. So. I'm pretty sure my facial hair would look like that after a while. Uh, no comments about the rest of the hairstyle. But this was was primo, uh, you know, like I said, basically during the same period that America was the Wild West, Australia was also in the Wild West of Australia. Uh, there was a gold rush in Victoria in the 1850s, uh, and uh, Ned's father was a, I was about to say Irish immigrant, but that's not quite correct. He was an Irishman, uh, who was accused of a crime, possibly falsely, uh, over a matter of, of horse thievery, and deported to Australia. Because if you recall, this is, what, this is the time period where uh, that was what Britain was doing. They'd lost their ability to take all of their criminals and send them to America. Uh, God bless America. You know, colors don't run, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Kekona. Uh, having done so, uh, they thankfully discovered Australia and realized they had a new... Uh, hellish wasteland to deport criminals to that was also full of natives who already lived there. Uh, watch out if Britain ever reactivates their space program. Uh, if you are a undesirable in London, you will find yourself deported to Mars soon. But uh, jokes about the British aside, uh, uh, Ned's father was uh, nicknamed Red, uh, which is probably where they got the idea for the joke in Borderlands pre-sequel, because that was made by 2K Australia for Red Belly. That's a Ned Kelly joke. 
Uh, but uh, Ned's father died when he was about 12. Uh, so he quickly became, you know, head of the household at a young age. He was in and out of trouble at this time period. He, you know, went to prison several times before he became an infamous outlaw. Uh, he was engaged in bare knuckle boxing while in prison. Uh, you know, he did have some basic schooling and he became familiar with the, the Bush. According to oral tradition, a.k.a. Uh, people said it, but we have no sources. Uh, he saved the life of a of a another boy from drowning in a creek when he was young and was awarded a green sash that he was allegedly wearing, uh, even as far as his final stand. But, you know, he became a, a bush ranger, a rambling gambler, a larrikin, which is an Australian word for a layabout ruffian, many other funny slang words. Uh, things really got in trouble with, with the Victoria uh, police because, uh, you know, he was accused of horse thief and stuff, but uh, there was an incident where uh, a uh, constable was out looking for uh, Ned's brother Dan, arrived at his house. According to the Kelly family, uh, th- that uh, Constable Fitzpatrick, uh, who, uh, here, I'll provide, I'll provide the patrons with extra pictures. Constable Fitzpatrick looks like this. Uh, according to the Kelly family, Fitzpatrick made unwanted advances on Ned's sister and was uh, violent and aggressive, and uh, Ned uh, beat him up and shot him, uh, but did save his life by pulling the bullet out and sending him home. But uh, he was a crime man then, so he had to go. Uh, he uh, was was tried and escaped uh, and, you know, became one with the Bush. He had a gang known as the Kelly Gang, and they engaged in several uh, businesses uh, and uh, obviously acquired a, a little bit of a, a, you know, what would you say? Uh, not quite a fan following, but, you know, ha- had the support of the people. Um, obviously, they did engage in, you know, highway robbery and lots of other stuff. Um, they did rob banks. But uh, apparently what, you know, the Kelly gang would do upon robbing a bank is they would bust open the vault, find all of the, uh, like, uh, mortgage slips and debts that people had in the bank, and they would burn them, thus erasing your debt. So, like, uh, they were reasonably popular. Uh, it does seem like the, the, the constables in Victoria had a hard time, like, actually getting any intel about any headway on them, because not only were, you know, Kelly and his uh, three fellows, including his brother Dan, like, used to living in the woods and, and, you know, surviving in the bush, but also were were supported by the local people because they were anti-authority. Uh, eventually, they had an 8,000-pound uh, bounty posted, which, oh, thank you, Wikipedia. Wikipedia has tabulated that. Uh, that's about uh, modern uh, 3 million Australian dollar dues. So, like, racked up quite a bounty. Unfortunately, the boys were caught... Uh, as most crime sprees are, uh, uh, by a, uh, what you call it, uh, a, a, uh, flummoxing of circumstance. You see, they, uh, captured a train station in Gunrowan, and were planning on blowing up the train. Uh, problem. The train never arrived properly, so they could not blow it up. So they were stuck inside the train station for, like, two days with a bunch of hostages. Um, now, there are kind of, like conflicting responses like uh, allegedly they had like up to 62 hostages in the Glen Rowan Inn but there were sympathizers who helped keep everybody in control and like later people said that they weren't you know really treated badly but eventually they were you know surrounded by police and there was a big shootout uh all the rest of the members of the Kelly gang died but Ned Kelly emerged in his famous suit of armor which was a iron helmet and you know breastplate uh made from uh Y- you've heard of swords, swords to plowshares. Well, this is plowshares to armor, uh, made in the bush with a box of scraps, etc. And uh, Kelly was really robust in this thing. It was like, uh, you know, visibility was poor. It was, it was like, uh, you know, around dawn when this happened. So like, there was early morning fog. He like came out of the mist. Um, eyewitnesses thought he may have been a ghost or a devil or a bunyip. You know, mm-hmm. um, a journalist literally wrote down. He looked like the ghost of Hamlet's father, uh, you know, and there was terrible sounds because the bullets bounced off the iron plate, which is allegedly around six millimeters thick. Um, actually, I shouldn't say allegedly. I believe they have it in a museum, so reported as six millimeters. Uh, and he took multiple shots, including taking shots to his arms and legs because those were not armored. And Ned Kelly was only stopped by a close range shotgun blast to the chest. Even this did not kill him. 
He lived and was able to uh, stand trial and be hanged. Uh, though, uh, apparently, uh, again, according to some sources, some 30,000 people petitioned in to have clemency. Uh, obviously, the local authorities did not uh, follow through with this. But, you know, like I said, Australia's Robin Hood. Well thought of. Uh, you know, there there were some, some thoughts and stuff. But I want to say, you know, the there's a great line where there are multiple reports of Ned Kelly's last words. But, like I said, after all this, 25 years old. You know, father died at 12, been living in the bush for years, just survived a horrible shootout with the police that killed, you know, his brother and his gang. What what are his last words reported as? Uh, some witnesses say that his last words were, such is life, um, but a uh, newspaper also quoted that his uh, final words were, ah, well, I suppose it has come to this, which is just like, if you're gonna, if you're going to be hanged, that's a decent one to run through, just being like, well, here we are. Uh, but like I said, uh, I think Kelly's an actual good fit for a heroic spirit because obviously, like I said, there's a bit of an anti-hero or anti-establishment flair to him. But also, uh, this story is super popular. Uh, I think I alluded to it before, but uh, there's a shitload of plays and movies and TV adaptations and, and books even about Ned Kelly's life and his and his gang. Um, one of which, the 1906 silent film, The True Story of the Kelly Gang, is recorded in history as the world's first feature-length narrative film. Wow. Like, actually, like, holding a record. The, the the true story of the Kelly gang, which I believe was partially lost, but was recovered and restored. Uh, they lost bits of it, but it was a, like, multi-part seven-act structure that was, you know, several, uh, you know, a, a lengthy amount of minutes long and was actually presented in a narrative format. Most silent films up to that point were just, you know, hey, look what we can do, uh, or were more entertainment-based or series of shorts. So there is a a serious uh, historical pedigree to this, uh, which again is very funny given our previous works, but uh, yeah, uh, let me see if I can find the, no, that's the picture uh, for the people in the chat. That's right, the Wikipedia spelled already. Uh, here, I'll throw it in the patron chat. Here is uh, actual factual Ned Kelly's armor in the museum. You can see with real life dents. But yeah, so like I said, with, with all these uh, direct and indirect comparisons of the Robin Hood, I decided to switch back from Berserker to uh, Archer, though I kept some notes in there, you'll see. So, for the actual profile, Ned Kelly, uh, alignment, uh, I guess we'd call it, uh, like, chaotic balance in these cases, but, but chaotic neutral. Not, not quite enough to, to score a chaotic good, but, uh, not evil per se with all that stuff going on, you know? Uh, who's to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, cops actually, you know, were, were in the right. Uh, stats, Strength C, middle of the road. I think Robin Hood is like a C plus or something, so, you know, it sounds about right. Endurance B, he's a, he's a pretty tough guy. Agility only C plus, which is a pretty low for an archer, but still has a little bit of an edge. Magic power, mana, you know, uh, E, low. Luck C, he had a decent run of luck, but not too good. Noble Phantasm, D plus. He's not really good at that. Uh, making him an archer did mean that we could swap around... Um, uh, effects there, uh, give him independent action B. A lot of our other, you know, shooty, snipey types uh, have pretty high independent action. I figured a B was good. He's got a pretty strong legend of, of surviving out on his own, but uh, also is used to working with a, with a team. Uh, did give him writing C. He was supposed to be a horseman and was a horse thief, or accused of it being at any point, so he would have a normal amount of, of writing. Uh, no magic resistance is included because we'll cover that later, but archers do technically get magic resistance usually as part of their class kit. Uh, personal skills got a few, some of which, you know, are, are probably uh, would be losable in FGO, but general profile stuff. First, bare knuckle boxing D. Like I said, uh, Ned Kelly was was known to engage in, in boxing. Uh, and in fact, there's a, if you want the proof in the pudding, let me scroll to find it. But uh, there is an actual uh, old timey... Uh, picture of kelly as a boxer and indeed bare knuckled very fancy trousers but you know he he has some close combat knowledge he was involved in a few fist fights uh ac again according to uh oral tradition uh you know on the subject of uh receiving a stolen horse he is said to have challenged the man who got the stolen horse from to a fisticuffs in jail unknown whether or not that actually happened but that's what they say so it's it's part of his mythology so Basically, it's a low rank skill, but it means that despite the fact that he's an archer, uh, Ned has the close combat potential of a berserker. He actually knows how to throw a punch or a kick. He'd probably have this in some animations in, in a game like FGO, where he you know has some bare knuckle combos in there, and obviously in his actual armor, his uh, 
arms and legs were were unencumbered. So this is this is part of my keeping our berserker touches alive. Uh, next skill, Bush Ranger C plus. So this is kind of a skill I took notes from a couple of other of our famous marksman characters, like uh, upcoming uh, Sugitani Zenjubo and previous William Tell. Basically, a skill that Ned Kelly and other Australian survivalist types would have. He can persist in the bush in the outback, um, which even in our modern times, the outback is considered like, and the Australian bush is considered very tough, very miserable terrain. Uh, basically, offers Ned a bit of presence concealment when natural environments, and he get, possesses tracking and evasion skills in wilderness. Its rank will be reduced in urban environments, but it gives him, you know, uh, extra ability to, you know, tuck up, evade, track. Uh, probably, especially because of where this would work in FGO, uh, maybe like add like a, a you know one hit three turn evade on a forest map but its primary effect is probably similar to press con of just like increase star gen and crit damage for a few turns you know normal stuff like that uh do have marksmanship c plus not as crazy high as like billy the kid or you know uh william tell etc but marksmanship is a, one of our standard skills that a lot of servants have for shooting techniques draws trick shooting etc ability with small arms ned was considered a crack shot um, you know, he was good with both a rifle and with revolvers, but his legend specifically about the shooting are not so overblown as, you know, other, like, Wild West figures and other famous outlaws. So, uh, an average rank. Uh, I did put down, uh, with quotation marks, such as life, A rank as, you know, his reported last words. Let's come to this. Uh, basically encapsulating his entire, you know, life story and mythos into a skill level. Uh, combine both Batcon and Disengage. Uh, literally in that final shootout, he was said to have been struck multiple times in the arms and legs and kept going, couldn't even be killed by a close-range shotgun blast that just, you know, knocked him on his ass and winded him. Uh, so he can keep fighting despite wounds, and also he was evasive, so it has that disengage power to, you know, reverse the circumstance and, uh, you know, reset the battle parameters. This would probably be a pretty decent guts and a self-debuff clear, maybe also a debuff removal resist so the enemies cannot get rid of your guts, you know, decent package. Um, Probably not too crazy of a guts. I'm imagining that Ned Kelly would probably be like a be like a two or three star. So you got a selection of skills, and then noble phantasms. Uh, we got a couple ideas. The one you're here for though is armor of the Kelly gang. <laughs> a C plus plus rank noble phantasm. It's his armor. It's the breastplate and helmet. Uh, I thought about making it like an always on noble phantasm, but that would make it very obvious that Ned Kelly is Ned Kelly. You know, uh, not good for for mysticism. So it's not always active. He was seen without it, and in fact, actually, I didn't say this earlier, but uh. According to, to history, like, uh, you know, historians working on this, uh, the Victoria Province police were reported multiple times that Kelly and the Kelly gang were in possession of this iron armor and just didn't believe it. So they were completely flabbergasted when he showed up in it. Um, so it just kind of like manifests, you know, quickly if he needs to. Um, you know, uh, the armor is actually like pretty well made. Like they had blacksmith test it and they thought it had to be made in like a professional forge. No, it was made in the bush. Uh, basically, in it, Ned is completely bulletproof, even though his arms and legs aren't protected, you know, unless the enemy is really good, it has special aiming powers. Um, he basically is completely immune to, to modern mundane weapons that are gun-based. Also, any gun-based noble phantasms would have a really hard time damaging him through the armor. And also, it would resist minor mystics, because like I said, people literally, like, thought he was, you know, a bunyip, a phantasmal coming out of the, out of the fog, so... This would also count as the equivalent rank of magic resistance, probably. So it does does give him some of that inherent magical resistance, and would also mean that, like, minor mystical effects would do it. It probably won't stand up to, you know, like, being hit at close range with, like, a, you know, A-rank holy sword or anything, but any gun-wielding servant, and probably even, like, any normal arrow-based archer just throwing arrows at him probably would clang off. Uh, and it does say that while it is activated, uh, he can am I enter basically a rampage-like state where he attacks continuously. So it's kind of got a berserker mode built in. And indeed, I'm not sure like in FGO how you would do this with the NP, but uh, you could make it like a fully support NP, or you could make it so it's also an AOE attack. Like he does attack enemies constantly, but it also like gives him you know one turn of invul first as well, or something like that. You know. It does have a, a conceptual weakness. It doesn't protect his arms and legs. So it's funny where, like, Ned Kelly is the kind of servant who, like, super hard counters other archers up until he doesn't because every archer has, like, super high levels of clairvoyance and supernatural aiming skills so they could just aim for the weak points. Uh, but 
ironically, I feel like Ned Kelly is a kind of servant who would stop a master like uh, Kiritsugu, for instance, who's like so reliant on his gunplay tools that other mages don't understand. Ned Kelly would just be like, oh, cool, you have a submachine gun. Nine mil doesn't do anything, you know, insert nine millimeter memes here. But, uh, you know, just a very funny one little stuff like that. I mean, if you wanted to do it like like super AOE, you could you could actually make make it give him a rampage buff. So he does AOE normals. That could be a good trade off for not having a damaging NP for a guy who's like pretty low rarity. Uh, I do have a second Noble Phantasm recorded uh, story of the Kelly gang. You know, this is only a D plus rank Noble Phantasm, but. I figure there's some stuff here for some extra ability, just for some utility. This could be like a profile-only note, or could actually show up as a skill. Uh, the original Kelly gang was just Ned Kelly, uh, Joe Byrne, Dan Kelly, and Steve Hart. So there were four of them total. The other three men perished during the Glen Rowan uh, shootout, so they're kind of like part of the mythos of him. But like I said, allegedly th- 30,000 people you know, signed a petition for clemency, even though it failed, and... You know, his his story was immortalized in film multiple times. So, you know, there's kind of a, like, myth of the Kelly gang around Ned Kelly. So where he goes, he can, you know, summon phantom spirits to help him out. Let's him multitask, you know, fire from multiple angles, move silently, plant explosive barrels, etc. Um, you know, if he has connection to a ley line on the land, he could even activate its true name to summon multiple phantom spirits. Uh, they would basically be kind of like paper tigers, though. Like, they would... Their myths aren't very strong, so they would disperse basically with any kind of interference. You hit them, you counterspell them, whatever. Uh, could be seen as a skill to like give him some some inherent anti lawful uh, attack ability, you know, because it is the Ned Kelly outlaw gang. But could just be that some extra bush rangers show up in some of his animations or something. And could even be these days, FGO is very creative with their unique passives. It could even just be like a passive he has, so he always has like ten percent extra damage versus lawful or something, you know. Low rarity servants aren't known for cracking, but it is uh, still some very fun stuff that you can do. Uh, I honestly think where we could have the most fun is in animations. I do kind of like the idea that like Ned isn't actually armored up until you use his his NP, and then he during the turn you've got the invul, he has the ar- the armor suit on, you know, mm-hmm. like actual activate armor mode stuff like that is very fun. Uh, but you could have a lot of creativity because, like I said, he was a boxer. Uh, you know, he's been known to, to use a knife at times. He was both a rifleman and a shooter with revolvers. There's the story of, like, the, you know, barrels of black powder to blow up the train and shit. Um, you know, if we're being very silly, we could include something uh, from from uh, Lot's gags. The enemy could literally be attacked by the bush. <laughs> shit like that. But, like, you know, uh, we, we flex here just to, like, stimulate everybody's brain cells, tell stories of, of myths and history that people may not have heard or you may have heard. And and do a little bit of theory crafting and yeah, I like I said, I think I think Ned Kelly's actually got like it like again, don't don't know for sure he is a real historical character, but so is Billy the Kid, but like he'd be a good pull for for not even just FGO, but any like funny old little uh fate story. And obviously, you know, if you did a fame bonus, like, you know, I don't know how strong he would be, but if you summon Ned Kelly in Australia, uh he'd be crazy strong. And also you have a really easy catalyst, his armor suit is in the museum, and so is the sash and all the other stuff. If his armor ever goes missing, you know, that's that's another one of our, uh, we're setting up for one of our Grail War uh, pieces, if anybody remembers those jokes from uh, from a few weeks ago. You know, we're trying to locate all of our, our uh, catalysts for servants. Well, I don't, Chad is saying like, oh, great for a master to have, you know, do a lot of crime. I don't know for sure, because a lot of his mythos and a lot of his skills are geared towards wilderness survival. I feel like in a Grail War story, Ned Kelly would be an absolute, like, pain in the ass mid-boss type guy. Like, you know, get him a master who's a not- not afraid to like hoof it in the woods like somebody with maybe like Caddox like survival style magecraft you know like he'd be an absolute pain in the dick because he's got you know invincibility noble phantasms and hide out in the woods skills and like shooting and stuff but usually actual fate grail wars tend more towards the urban fantasy type I, I do not think Ned Kelly would be conceptually suited for like robbing a metropolitan bank in the middle of you know Fuyuki City right also, in general, you shouldn't uh, rob banks in the middle of Fuyuki City because that breaks the masquerade or something. Somebody won't like you for that. Even though, uh, Fate Zero, we did canonically summon Cthulhu and try to have him come out of the fucking Fuyuki Bay. It's okay, the Mage Association, uh, MIB flashy thingy at everybody after that. Don't worry, it was a gas leak. <laughs> Storm Surge. I actually don't recall. I need to, like, recheck that episode or find the text in the light novel. I, I'm pretty sure that's what they said, was, like, that the Mage Association would, like, cover it up, and that's why, like, Everybody got together to take down uh, 
Giles like turbo big water horror uh, because he was threatening to like break the masquerade, but it's still like it still came out of the water and like you know Artoria shot a giant golden beam at it. Like people saw that shit. I mean, I guess yes. In the long term, it doesn't matter because the Fuyuki fire was pretty close. But like, I think they had an excuse for like how people were supposed to forget about it. Anyway, we're caught up. There's your Ned Kelly fan favorite Friday. Like I said, for November, I will run a new poll and get some more guys in there and you know get in there. Uh, I did have, you know, I, like I said, I, I wanted to put some new names in there to try and stimulate my brains to, to get some more new names in there for, for other polls to keep people interested, not keep uh, trying out the same same old, same old concepts for people to run down. And it kind of worked. I had fun. But, well, I haven't heard of Nymph November, but I gotta think. Are there any cool? I might be able to find somebody funny. There's a shitload of Greek nymphs, though. But anyway, that's our fan event Friday, which takes us to the What's Up Zone. Sorry, you're thinking about nymphs. The only one I can think about off the top of my head is Minth. Ugh. <sighs> Sorry, I just dropped a screwdriver. It happens. I actually uh, just got my uh, my Hexbolt security screwdriver back. Apparently, I, it dropped on the floor and I left it back in the old place. But luckily, I didn't need it in the intervening week. That would have been awkward. Yeah, but it's okay. It's fine. Got it back when I got the rest of my shelves, like I said. Luckily, I took a picture of, of my bookshelf and my game shelf so I could remember how high up the shelves go. Because they were not uh, delivered to me with shelves still in- attached. But that'll be this weekend. We'll be filling in all the stuff. Uh... I guess it is free talk. I can bring up a couple of moving stuff, but uh, yeah, no, we're 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 pretty well settled in. Uh, still don't have uh quite enough Ethernet cable to reach, and don't know when I'm gonna figure it out. So you may be in for another week of goopy streams, but you know we'll we'll figure it out as it comes. But uh, did finally get my mattress. It arrived. Uh, I told I think it was yeah I think this was on the the recording the the actual stream audio for uh for fourteen this week, but. I told the 14 crew this and then mentioned it later, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, allegedly, the reason why it was late was that the, the, uh, deliver of fires, which I believe was through UPS, not United States Postal Service, but, but what can Brown do for you, UPS? Uh, allegedly the package was lost, yes, I did do scare quotes there, uh, but then was found, uh, and they did eventually deliver it, uh, and how I think they figured out how to deliver it was on the box, uh, somebody literally in black and white, printed out the, like, overhead Google Maps street view, uh, street view, you know what I mean, like, the view of the streets on, on Google Maps, of my new address, and stuck it to the box, and wrote down the address next to it. So, like, they made double sure that whoever was handling this box knew where it was supposed to go. So it did get delivered. Um, and uh, this place is interesting, because it's, like, I don't know how, how my parents keep swinging this, hopefully for the last time, knock on wood, they can't really afford to buy another new house, so, you know, I think this will actually be the last move, but uh, the the lot of the land is pretty big. I think it might be, like, like two or three acres. Most of it's forested over, but we technically have, like, two driveways, basically, like, two spots where you can get out to the road. Um, so I think they went further down and came up the long way around rather than the shorter uh, drive driveway route that goes by the front door. Uh, that route, I can understand if you had a truck, is a little trepidatious right now because there's lots of logs and tree stumps from when the hurricane blew through here and knocked over a bunch of trees um so i understand if you don't want to come that way but uh that means that they dropped the mattress off in front of the garage and you know just dropped it off and left uh which is very fun because uh as as i you know i hear the truck roll up and they they drop it off and i go out to pick it up uh i notice on this box it says team lift required well there wasn't a team so uh, i did not really lift it but i had to drag it in from the garage all the way to uh, technically the the spare bedroom, uh, so I could you know unpack it, unfurl it. It's a hybrid. It's got like partial memory foam, partial spring, so it was vacuum packed. So I did you know the whole thing where I unsealed it and it magically sprung up. We left it out, but got it set up on the bed, readjusted my bed frame. It's all you know very compact and normal and neat, and it's good. It's also a good mattress. It's helping me sleep better. It's m- 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 much better than my previous mattress, which was scrunkled to hell. And it is better than the air mattress because it is um, a much more manageable height off the ground, and I don't feel like I'm going to fall out of bed. Nor am I so high up that I bang my arm or my noggin on my ceiling fan light, which is very low hanging, and uh, you know the the ceilings are a little lower in this place, so that did happen. So we're all normal. I've got my my shelves now. I can unpack my last couple of boxes and put all my shelf stuff. I mean, I will say this, Aaron. Aaron's saying better than an air mattress because it's actually a mattress. Yes, but my my previous mattress was in such a shari shari shape. Shush, 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 shush. Worshush, shush, shush. Uh, my previous mattress was in such a sorry shape 
that the air mattress was an improvement for a couple of days at least. But uh <laughs> again, Sushi Shari, yes. But yeah, so that's that's a good one on the move. Um so there's your, your moving story caught up. Uh but uh we have a handful of things to talk about. Um I'd like to rotate in a couple. Uh out of uh talking about metaphor, uh because you said in your mailbag post that you finished it at about a uh, hundred hours. Uh, yeah. I talk about metaphor, or uh, I also know you've been experimenting with some gotcha stuff. Uh, which one do you want to talk about first, Lucky? Well, uh, the gotcha one's not going to actually take that long. Because uh, Lucky has been, what's the word I want to say? Baited? Bribed? Brought over? Uh, bemused? I was going to think into playing prowl, but yeah, sure, baited. That's <laughs> that's that's what the internet will understand. <laughs> Um, into a new gacha game because I wasn't actually looking for it, but I was on Twitter and I saw a. Actually, I wonder. I probably can't find this, but hang on. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me see if I can jury rig something real fast here. It might take me a second, but. And I saw a clip of a character from a gacha game, and I went, "Oh no, that's my jam." Uh, let's see here. We gotta pull up some stuff. Da, da, da. Button, button, button. This PC creator tool. ABS. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I, I do not throw stones about getting uh blobbed with new games like that. That happens to me with like Steam games and shit. That you know, that's how I got into TCG uh, card shop simulator by just seeing a couple of people stream it and being like, "Man, this looks good. I got to get back to my card shop." They had an update, but I haven't uh, had as much time. But like, this is me like you know randomly scrolling on like fucking you know, PlayStation Store or PS Plus for like, ooh, that's a game I can download? Damn. Oh, I got a slight headache. Mm. Drink some water. Uh, water. Alright, loading it up. Do, 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 do. Alright, let's just do it quick. Here we go here. Alright, got that. Let me go pull it up real quick. Do videos. I mean, slightly quiet chat because I'm debating whether or not I would just want to download the PS Plus version of Ghost of Tsushima's Director's Cut rather than dance around with my disc copy because i technically missed the window to like you gotta buy the upgrade uh, it's free on ps plus so if i just don't bother with the disc version for once i can just get director's cut i'll save that question for later yes lucky has produced a small video i produced a small video of the um the character trailer in the game outer plane of their uh, seasonal variant of tom no my uh the kids of eternity which is you know a uh, big titty fox wife i'm just like oh, boy you can't do this to me. So I installed the game, and after, you know, re-rolling for, like, a year, it wasn't actually a year, it was, like, two hours, I was able to uh, get her, and I'm, like, not sure if I want to keep playing this game. It does seem more interesting than the first place, but it's just something that I've just been playing on a little bit for a little bit more, on a little bit, for a little bit. Like, once the, uh, once the uh, event's over, I might drop it. But I haven't, like, I have been trying, um... Outer planes, and it's all right. I think it's okay. It's kind of, it's kind of a uh, coded like um, Princess Connect in its gameplay, and um, actually in a lot of in a lot of ways, I think it is. But doesn't necessarily really hold me. Hold me. I am literally here because it has a big titty fox wife. I am a simple man. I know what I like. You I also realize that this. Yep, I like what I like. They actually have um that that since that's the uh, seasonal variant, that means they also have a normal ass Tomino no Mai. I'm like shit. There's two of them. Like, oh no. But no, there's not really much to actually talk about. It. Talk about it and uh, truth. Uh, I could probably talk. Oh, excuse me. I could probably talk way more at length at uh, metaphor because um as Omega mentioned earlier, I have beaten it. I beat it at. My file says like 115, 120. I can't actually remember what it said, but I know that's not accurate because I have left that game on for um, a while. But I beat it. I like it. Not entirely sure where to go talking about it. Uh, so uh, I guess picking up from last week, talking about metaphor is I definitely do think it is supposed to be a sort of onboarding process for fans for both fans of um smt persona and maybe people who haven't uh tried it before the storytelling's really good um and i do want to say i do not believe that necessarily the overarching story is about you know racism is bad and whatnot although there is a lot of that i think it's more along the lines of 
what's the word I want to say? You need to believe in something better. I think is the best way to put it. Um, there's a whole bunch of injustices of all sorts of ways throughout the world, and if you do not believe and fight for the future you want, it will not come. Um, and even and it will and no matter what, it will not be easy. Um, I there are very there are varying accounts of why I think this is the kind of the overwhelming spirit about it, but uh, wow, man, this ending is actually starting to get to me a little bit. But um, it's it's a good it's a good story. I think some of my complaints still rang true. I think still think that fourteen followers total is probably a little low. Like I said, even at the end of the day, you have your seven party members and then just seven other people that you kind of know. Uh, I guess I. I Hulkenberg and Brigitte are still my faves. I love them. I love them the bits. The conclusion of the story is probably not as cool as I would like. Like I said, they try to do some classic Persona stuff here, but it kind of falls flat with me, and it feels really, really rushed. I'm gonna be real. I'm gonna. I'm. I. I'm. I'm kind of gonna double down on. I think they cut some stuff to make a um, to make the release date. Because once you hit, uh, where was it, about Altaberry, uh, Altaberry Heights, things feel very rushed. Very rushed. Like, um, Altaberry Heights, it's like the fifth town you get to. It doesn't actually have a dungeon. You just have kind of a countdown before something happens. You just gotta kind of do your own stuff. Then you go to another place, someplace else, just to have one single boss fight. You'd never go back there, never go back there again. Um, like... There's another fight that's just in there and has like no kind of lead up or follow up. It just kind of happens. You feel like you're there's That feels like there's very many conversations that's just kind of rushed. There's a lot of exposition. Oh yeah, no, Vernon. Vernon knows exactly what I'm talking about. Like yes, no, that area should have actually been a dungeon, and then uh, fighting the person should have been at the end. But no, you just go out front, you fight a person, you leave. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of exposition in the back. The final dungeon is pretty short, and it does actually something that I think was I think was kind of kind of neat. They did the Mega Man uh boss rush where you basically had to go fight every single boss, um, well a specific type of boss that you fight before, just you know kind of buffed up to um to uh, end game levels, which was fun. It was neat. It was kind of fun to revisit all these old bosses and you know try out new things on them. But the actual see. This is a problem that I think this is this is this is a me problem right here, but I actually over grinded too much. And I was able to get a ability, um, because you have something called synthesis abilities that basically um you get it basically takes up two turns and you get to do a super attack with another teammate. So depending on what archetypes you have out there, you can do for them things. There is a synthesis attack called um shit, what was it called actually? It was Apocalypse something. But I got the super attack. So this is a game where if you're hitting 2k damage on something, you are doing fucking phenomenal. I mean, this fucking phenomenal. Um, this ability is like you get it from you get it because you have to get a key item called Chronicle of the End, and you can only get Chronicle of the End when you have unlocked the Royal Archetypes, which is the final archetype of all your player characters. To get the Royal Archetype of uh of a character. You have to max out their their bond. So if you want to get the if you want to get crown look at the end, you have to max out basically all your party members' bond and unlock and unlock the royal um, the royal archetype, which usually requires a combination of two to three archetypes to get it. Me because I have been completely grind happy this um, entire game. Got it, and I unlocked Chronicle of the End. What Chronicle of the End does is it costs everyone ninety nine MP. And it takes four turn slots, but it does 9,999 damage to everything on the screen. To all your enemies. Ah, yes. The big rule. It trivializes a lot of fights. And I had that again up against the final boss. I'm just like, I don't know if it's just because I've overleveled or they didn't like put a lot of thought into this, but I have like completely and utterly destroyed, destroyed the final boss. It was, it was not a challenge. This is also partly my fault because the final dungeon that you can get to actually is very good for grinding. Um, there are these giant teeth enemies on there, which are like level like 89 or something. But they drop like they give like so much per, uh, XP and give like a ridiculous amount of um, archetype XP. If you can um, 
if you can um unscathe clear one of them you will get about i think i was still getting around like um almost five thousand um five thousand um archetype or um exp per per battle they're not easy they're not easy to do because they are two and one is completely immune to magic the other one is completely immune to physical so you can't just throw things at them and try to blow them up while you have the stun. You actually have to find the whittle them down one at a time until you do it. But that was until I got um I can't remember the thing. It was like a apocalypse ruin something. I don't know. Until I got the you know the um big bang attack and uh, I just started blowing them up because again at the final dungeon you can go back to the beginning because it's the final dungeon. You can't go back. It's the final day. You know, uh, twelve hours remaining. You can just go back to the beginning, rest, and you can buy freaking MP restoring items from from uh, your pilot so at the no at no point do you necessarily feel um feel the uh, mp crunch that has been prevalent throughout uh most of the game um and again uh they tried to do kind of a persona kind of style of ending with you know the big final power up but it kind of fell flat in my opinion but it, it is how it is not everything can be perfect uh things uh things happen i don't necessarily want to spoil fully what's going on in there because i do want people to play it because i do heartily recommend it it's just, it is, uh, I feel like people are praising it a little too much, I want to say. It's like, oh, like, it's good. It's like, it's a very good game. I put it at like a solid, like, like I put it at like a solid eight for me. But, um, I think, I think people like try to overhype some, some, some aspects of it. Like a lot of people like talking about like, oh, the menu design is so cool. Boy, it's just like, it's just a three frame of, three frame painting of your characters at various body parts that's it that's all they're doing it's a painting of three frames like i don't know why everyone is so be like mm, oh so good uh. like uh well, i shouldn't say it's a watercolor painting but it is a painting of some kind um uh, like i actually did listen to like the the um the dub for a bit you know started over i'm actually not not that impressed with it it's okay but like it's okay, but I'm just like, no, it's 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 okay. I don't know why people are like screaming about the accents and whatnot. Oh, <laughs> oh excuse me. Thank you. Um, like I said, I am a little bit biased. Um, like I said, I've been uh, I played through my first playthrough on Japanese. I didn't recognize a lot of the names, but um, Natsuki, um, Hanae, and um, and um, Sari Hayami are in it. Uh, uh, Hayamin is um, Hulkenberg and best thing i can freaking uh hope for uh most people might not recognize um uh natsuki hanai but he is the voice of um tanjiro from demon slayer i think that'd probably be the uh easiest one to do. And he has he has very much the good boy voice and i love it so i think i think some people like like metaphor refantasio is a very good game and i hardly recommend it to anyone who's a fan of jp of jrpgs both you know new and old but i and I don't want to just like I don't want to throw this necessarily on just people playing this game. I feel like there's this is like something that's been happening a lot in the area of video game journalism and video game um, critique is where people I think we've talked about this before. People go way too far to re- in directions of whether they hate this game or they love this game, and I find it really fucking weird. Yeah, nobody, and I don't know. You know, with reviews, it could just be because a a just like a mediocre game, a mediocre review doesn't sell. But like, it's true, but. You know, it. You know, it, it's one of those things where like, there's lots of really good titles coming out all the time, but also there are uh, problems in the industry. But you know, Metaphor, uh, Atlas launched a new IP. It's pretty good. Like you mm-hmm. himself said, you know, probably rated as about an eight. It's pretty high. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the Metacritic score is was something like in the ninety-ish range. Let me check. Actually, I think it was like in the low nineties, if I remember correctly. Gummies, games, games, games. Like. Um, something that actually did really help the game for me, though, is that once you get kind of out of the starting town area, they start to, um, bring in the humor back in, and that's actually was something that, um, I think was actually very important to the game. Um, if the game had taken itself way too seriously the entire freaking game, I don't think I would have been able to handle it. Uh, yes, but... It's, uh, metaphor is solidly in the, the low 90s range. It's, it's you know, it's got, it, in a few different places. Uh, it seems like the most reviews, the critical reviews are on ps5 which it is a 93 even though that is the most critic reviews but it's like 91 on pc 92 on xbox you know it's still in the low 90s so uh, trending very well yeah uh 
But they do do a lot of uh, humor and gags and whatnot, and I think that's actually pretty important. Like I said, uh, the like the followers, like I said, some of them were very good, some of them were kind of meh. Uh, I think I talked about that uh, last time. I enjoyed, like I said, I enjoyed the press turn. I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed the press turn system. I'm glad they brought it over from SMT. Like I said, now I feel like I know a little bit more about SMT and how that works. And I think that's very important to you know convey that because again, you know, SMT and Persona have almost basically split in um, in fandoms now. So <clears throat> it's. Um, I think it's good that they can kind of you know through this game kind of bring a little bit from each of them. Like I said, I do think, like, I'm not entirely sure, like, like I said, I put a hundred hours into this game. A hundred hours. This is partly because I grind, I grind a lot, but I did everything. I did everything in that game that I could on that playthrough. Um, I, like I said, I unlocked all royal archetypes and mastered them. I got, I unlocked every archetype for the protagonist because that was an achievement. I did all quests. I did all dungeons. I found all locations. I maxed out everyone's bond. Which is, I think this is actually something I think is a very big plus. Going in blind, I was able to max out all my character, arc, my, my royal archetypes, my, not my, my royal virtues, you know, my five stats, and max out, bond out everyone. Like, that is important. Normally, when I play, like, a Persona game for the first time, I can't do that shit. I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. Um, so, Metaphor was able to let me, you know, do everything I wanted to do in one playthrough. I was expecting I was going to have to go... All right, we're back. Sorry. I'll say that part, too, because... Uh... Lucky got caught up in a thought there because my audio crashed, but it's fine. We're good. Uh, you were in the middle of talking about something uh, that I think is quite good and also neat, which was that uh, you were able to basically max out everything on your first playthrough of Metaphor, which is something that I was going to say from experience. Like, generally, I don't think I've ever been able to do that in a Persona game, right? Like, um, with with even with uh, with P5, like the I think the only thing I came close to was was like working on um, Royal, but obviously that was also technically pre-watched. I'd already played it, so yeah, that's uh, that does seem to be a what you call it uh, a big positive, you know. And also, I think uh, talks about the thing you said, which is it seems like their design goal was for this to be kind of an entry into their bigger, longer franchises that people may be more daunted by. I guess. I mean, yeah. Because I do think think there is something to be slightly uh, terrifying about, you know, going into a game series that, you know, has, you know, oh, this is the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and whatnot, especially if we don't talk about the first two. You know, it's a big, big man, you know, you know, uh, cut it. But, um, <clears throat> yes, no, it's uh, nice that you can get through basically everything in one playthrough, and I think that helps. And you can still go into New Game Plus and start with, Get start and start with all the stuff. That's how you unlock the uh, final difficulty, uh, Regicide. I have not tried playing that. I do not know if I ever will. It probably depends on whether or not I have. There's a trophy associated with it or not. There probably is because the game likes to fuck me over. Yeah. Um. Let's see. What else is to talk about? Um. I think I mentioned it before. I definitely wouldn't mind seeing a uh, sequel to uh to said game, uh, metaphor. They have, they, um, there is implications that, you know, maybe the journey is not quite over. There are like, you know, lands outside to be, still be explored and stuff, but they kind of do it in a, they kind of do it in the, uh, Persona 5 way where, you know, everyone just kind of gets into a car and leaves to go on summer vacation, kind of. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get a uh, Metaphor Reef Fantasio Strikers. I wouldn't mind that, honestly. Um, because Metaphor does have actually an interesting system that I do kind of like. Um, because they kind of, they kind of, they try to sell it as this kind of like hybrid combat thing. And it's kind of is, but kind of isn't basically enemies run around on the field and you can go up and slap them. And if you slap them enough, you can start a, um, preemptive battle with them where they start stunned and you can, you know, you do some free damage and, you know, it goes on there. The interesting thing though, is if you've sufficiently over leveled them, you can just kill them straight out and still get XP and rewards from it. And like I said, since you're always uh, um, you're always um, controlling the main character, and the main character can be you know arc various archetypes. You can have like various attack styles and whatnot. So I think the bones of a of a Musou game is already there. And honestly, that'd probably be actually very good if they were to go. Um, oh, there's a trophy for the super boss, which is new game plus, but nothing for the difficulty. All right, that's all right then. 
Uh, I might do that then. No, I wonder what some of these other hidden trophies are. Hmm. But, um, yes, no, there's, there's, uh, several things. I can, I want to talk about, like, I want them to be more characters, like, involved in that, like, or, like, more different party members, stuff like that, because there's a lot, there's a lot of likable characters in Meta for, uh, Catherine, the, uh, the pirate puss, uh, bounty hunter, voiced in Japanese by Alpha Rose. She's great. I love her. I think one of the funniest things is, is that when, um, when uh you max her out she has the uh well it's not necessarily max i think it's like her seven but she has the ability just to join you in certain sub dungeons and basically every battle you get into she'll just basically like half kill a, a um half kill a mob in there and she does this on the bosses too uh there's a tower in altaberry height that you go to part of a three dungeon quest change to kill to kill dragons and I got to the top of that fucking thing, and I'm fighting this big ass dragon, and and Catherine just comes in and just punches this boss for like a third of its health. I'm just like, okay, that was like six thousand damage. Thank you. Uh, it was kind of funny. Yeah, actually, and like thinking about it, I think I had more more trouble with the um big. There's a um, at the at the end game. There's a quest you can do where you go fight big three big dragons and um and uh get cool stuff from them. I had way more troubles with that three uh those three dragons than um. Then, um, I did the final boss. <laughs> One, the Devourer of Flames kicked my ass so hard. It took me, like, literally two hours to do because I died a couple times. Because, uh, the dragon has an attack called Burn It All, where it just breathes fire on everyone, and everyone takes 990, 9,999 damage. This is me being with, like, you know, 800 HP. And I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ. The only way you can stop it is if you have something that blocks or repel, f- repels fire. And archetypes don't give you that natively. You can get, you'll get weaknesses and you'll get, you know, resist, but you won't get any blocks. So you have to be constantly using abilities or have equipments that block or repel flames. It ended up that basically my main character will basically 1v1 this fucking dragon for like forever. It was probably not the Primo strat, but I didn't have, um, I had done a goof. I had saved, um, in the dungeon. Cause usually I, have, usually I have two, uh, two files. One is I save. When I start the day, and then I have a second file, well, not start the day, but like, you know, start a, at a significant plot point. And the next one is usually when I, is the one I save off, like when I'm in dungeons where I'm about to do a big boss and stuff. I had accidentally saved over my day one. So if I wanted to, you know, go out and change like an item, because like I said, they're not necessarily shy about giving you items to do stuff, but sometimes, um, it's actually pretty neat, but you can purify items. And some items actually have multiple forms and you can switch them up. Like you can get boots that either like block ice, block wind, block lightning, block fire, but you can only have one at a time. If you want to trade, if you have to, if you want to change them, you have to run to the church and switch them out. And Lucky was like, all right, I am not going to waste one single day so I can go, so I can just go back, change one piece of item and come back and do this all over again. I'm not doing that. I'm figuring this out right now. And it just turns out Will versus the Devourer of Flames 1v1 was the way to do it. Uh, Sometimes it do be like that. I mean, you know. No, I had a, um, I had a bit of a rant on him earlier because the dragon would either do would do um, would either do like burn it all, which would do that, or it would do bewitching flame, which could cast charm on everybody. And he, he would they would he would basically alternate doing that like every turn. I'm just like, Ugh! so like even like like. So it was it, it was rough. Like, ugh. what was the other ones? The Devourer of Stars and Devourer of Nations. I think it was. The Devourer of Stars was interesting because they hit you with my asthma and it took everyone down to three hundred health tops. I was like, oh, I got to be more. You know, I got to be more proactive about keeping my health up and stuff. They're actually they're pretty fun fights. It's just one of them caught me off guard, which was the problem. Mm. Very good dragon names. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see anything else about metaphor. Like I said, the message is about. I, I think overall, I think the message is about believing in a fantasy, and sometimes that fantasy is, you know, the the dream is the the, and that fantasy is a dream of a better life, a better life for other people, and even if it seems like something unrealistic and unattainable, you still got to keep going for it. It's super important. Like I said, I enjoyed the characters, I enjoyed the humor, I enjoyed most of the character writing. Uh, your big bad villain is big and bad, but he is not. What's the word I want to say? He's not wrong. He's just doing everything the wrong way. I think I want to say, um, like, 
even like several times throughout the like parent people are like yeah he's right but he's you know kind of being a fucking dick and they're like so we gotta stop him can't have no dicks uh the writing's on a roll for a lot of stuff there's a lot of things that i predicted would happen way before they'd happen some things i figured out like you know like 20 to 30 minutes before they happen i don't necessarily want to spoil them because i do think that people will still want to play it actually megan did you pick up the did you pick up um i'm sorry someone said capture that lucky line i'm just like what lucky line yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm just hearing science, and I'm like concerned. Like, are we okay? Is my audio still good? <laughs> oh, thank you, but no, thank you. But um, shoot, what was I saying? I got completely derailed by that. You were asking me if I picked up something, but I don't know what. You meant. Oh, did you pick up metaphor at any point? Because I could have swore that I saw like I was playing, and it says your friends have this game. And uh, game I like had the demo installed. I actually just uh oh, cleared it off because I will probably be purchasing the full game at some point, and I'll just play it all then. I don't need to be upsold on this game anymore. But yeah, I never actually got into the demo because it, you know, hit right around a couple of other things and then just didn't have time. Yes, no, the game is quite good. It plays very well. The story is, like I said, fairly good for the majority of it. It does kind of like rush at the end. Very strong themes, very strong music. Um, Music was still done by um, Shoji. um, Is it Shoji Maguro? Yes. Maguro. Maguro. But um, the thing I love is they got they got the head priest from the Mujoji Temple to do all the fucking chanting. All that, all that. That's a fucking that's a fucking priest from a temple just chanting high speed at you. I'm like, oh, I love it. It's so good. Um, but yeah, it has a lot of strong music. Like I said, I played in Japanese, so like I can only really say that you know the Japanese uh, voice actors is very good. Fun fact, the guy who plays um Himes May in Japanese is the same guy that they have play um Solid Snake in the in the uh, Metal Gear series. I did not know that. I was like, "Oh my god. It's kind of hilarious." Which is double great because he kind of he plays um kind of a um he plays a um a character who's involved in doing, you know, the shady sneaky shit in the game. And I'm like, "Yes, perfect." The fact that I have not seen the um I have not seen this character uh, drawn in as a uh, Solid Snake um upsets me slightly. Just need that mim to percolate, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, I I definitely think I will be picking up metaphor. I just like I said, my my personal note to myself was I should really finish P three R first before I go order in a new video game, which is a shame because like a lot of really good games have come out. Like I'm very interested in Space Marine two. Loads of people are uh you know talking Space that up and, and it's got ongoing stuff going on. Um, and that's already come out. Uh, we haven't really talked about it on the show, but like. Everything that's come out for uh, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero, like mm-hmm. that, if you like like Dragon Ball even a little, and I say this as like, I think of myself as a very casual Dragon Ball fan. Like I didn't really like the series as a as a kid. I just missed a lot of opportunities to get into it. But thanks to like uh, Team Four Stars Dragon Ball Z, a bridge that kind of like got me more interested in like, okay, yeah, this you know they're they're cutting a lot of jokes, but also they have a lot of love for this series. And I have watched um the Kai cut. Uh, you know when they like re-edited down all the filler and redid their dub and stuff. So like I'm I I know the core. I tried to watch Super, but I think you know that says everything you need to know right there. Like par- parts of it were good, but there was a lot that wasn't and a lot of pack filler. Um, but like Sparking Zero like looks beautiful, plays beautiful, and does something which is really insane. Which is they have some truly cracked what if scenarios. Like, uh, you, you can play through the story and replicate, you know, battles from the original, the manga and anime and stuff and the movies, but, uh, uh, sometimes they do the really cool thing, which is you can just be like, oh yeah, uh, you, you know, defeated Freeze without having to switch to another guy. Uh, you feed him fast. Don't have to go Super Saiyan. It's just over. Freeze is dead. Spirit Ball got him. Good job. <laughs> uh, and some of those spin off into, like, longer stuff, so, like, it, I've seen some clips, I've seen some videos, and I'm just like... Yeah, this just looks really good, especially because I I played a lot of like Budokai and Budokai Tenkaichi with my my little neighborhood buddies when I was a very small child, you know, when I was like in my tens and twelves. So like that's great, but also Metaphor came out. You know, people are calling it possibly you know best RPG of the year. Uh, Veilguard comes out in a few days, and I'm very interested to see how that one goes. That's probably not a day one buy for me though, you know. So like lots of games coming out, and I still have a couple in my backlog to catch up. Like I have to polish off P3R and uh, Unicorn Overlord. Sa- sadly, a lot of a lot of games, even if I played them for a lot of hours, that came out around the the Rebirth sludge, like I got a little too intensified in. 
And honestly, what happened with the uh, UO is probably just we started actually playing Rain, and I like used my brain, my Rain brain, to just write Rain. Um, and you know, not not got as into just my methodical process of leveling everybody up. But yeah, so like me- metaphors on my list, I'll get it, but I should clean up a few things first. Uh, anything else you want to say about it, Lucky? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, uh, while we could talk at length forever about stuff, uh, we've got almost two and a half hours on the clock, and I know you were talking about your headache earlier. I'm also feeling a little uh, lightheaded, and my stomach's bothered me a few times today, so like I can't go on forever. Uh, I probably need to re-up my, my waterfication, but uh, you know, I've got a few things to talk about, but we won't slam at length. But uh, look forward to more metaphor th- thoughts in the, the future, perhaps. Perhaps. I'll, I'll catch up there someday. Uh, yeah, I got a couple of quick ones as well. Um, first, just something I want to I wanna say, which I'm actually very surprised to have seen a few times on Twitter. Uh, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance 2 is 17 years old. It's been 17 years since it came out. Uh, the exact anniversary was, I think, a couple of days ago. But uh, I have actually seen some acknowledgement of this. I've seen a couple of sites retweeted, seen a couple of people in the wild. And obviously, you know, the Twitter algorithm still works. It's a reason, one of the reasons why people haven't uncoupled from Twitter completely. Uh, but even uh, Final Fantasy themselves, like their official account, like tweeted about it and asked like, oh, what was your, you know, your favorite moment from the games? And I was like, I brought up some stuff. And then I was like, also like, bundle and re-release tactics A1 and 2. I even gave them a selection. I was like, but it'd be nice if uh, you could release it on Steam or perhaps the Switch or maybe PS5. You know, they were they were Game Boy Advance and Game Boy uh, and a DS game. So like, uh, I, I think a, a Switch port could work. I'm trying to think. I don't. Uh, A2 didn't really use the touch screen for much. Like you, you, you could touch interface stuff. Uh, like I think they put most of the gameplay on the touchpad on the DS, right? But you could just do a wrapper that has like two screens upresed, you know, or put it so the top screen is like a thing you can check. I'd I'd really like an opportunity to take another crack at those games with like you know maybe a little bit of a little funny haha quality of life but just in general just have them on something that uh, doesn't require me to run my DS, which is uh, I've talked about before. Uh, my my launch ass Nintendo DS is so old that the battery is super fucked. So you have to keep it plugged into the wall, which defeats the purpose. Give me my switch and let me my launch switch and let me strap more batteries to it instead. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, uh, I'm I'm a big fan of of A1 and A2. Um, real fun stuff. Uh, origin of uh Vera and Numos and lots of little guys. Um, and so like I would uh love to uh to take another crack at those and and have other people be able to get them because, you know, it's like buying physical carts of, like, GBA and DS games is tough these days and I don't know how in demand. I'm, I'm, uh, for for some reason, I I feel oddly confident that you can uh, indeed find some sort of emulatron device for Final Fantasy Tactics Advance uh, on the GBA. Just saying. And actually, you know, uh, hypothetically, you could find one for AO2 as well, but that's the... As much as our our friends are just like, oh, you can just PC emulate it. Yeah, you can, but one, that doesn't support the the future of releases in the company. But also, uh, emulator interfaces are not always the cleanest. Um, You're not meant to play a GBA game on a keyboard. They're just not optimized for that. Yeah, yeah, I know, you can hit Z and X and stuff, but it's always been a little weird to me. Um, But Chad actually brings up the next thing I want to talk about, which is uh, great, I'm, I'm glad you got into it and i see that lucky caught my uh retweet of a thing from uh rgg percolifying but uh yeah actually the other thing i wanted to talk about is uh the like a dragon yakuza tv series uh, i believe the first half of it is out because uh, i think they said there's only gonna get six episodes and i've watched it i watched it all last night actually uh because it was also the day that uh, the last three episodes of legend of vox machina season three came out as well uh, i won't wax too much on that one i've sung its praises before but uh they wrap up the season pretty good uh it's kind of funny because they have one of those, you know, soft sequelizing endings in the season. Like, it's not the the season one ended with a huge hook for season two. And uh, when they finished season two, they knew for a fact they were already green lit for season three. So, like, that ends with, like, a midpoint type cliffhanger as well, you know? Um, while they are renewed for season four, you don't need to worry about Amazon canceling the show just yet, but uh, they did not know that until, like, these last batch of episodes aired, so it has a much more open-ended, you know, uh, uh, setup. I'm pretty sure the fourth season will be the last, unless they want to do some of their weird side content, but it sounds like they're setting up for it to be the, the last one of the block. But that also coincided with uh, picking up the first three episodes of the Yakuza TV series, 
So I've watched all of them. Uh, we're only halfway through, but uh, I'm very interested to see what the back half is. It's very interesting. Now, some people might say when I say interesting, that's a negative. No, no, no. It is interesting. I am interested in this. <laughs> um, if you are a Yakuza diehard, like a purist, you are probably not going to like the TV adaptation. Um, and I will say, like, to to talk a little about things I noticed that I feel like were shortcomings, like, I mean, for a for a TV series based on, like, a dragon, there are times when I feel like the fight choreo is a little, like, underwhelming. Obviously, they're using real-ass people and stunt doubles, you know? Like, I have, a, I have not seen a, a shitload of CGI in this show. Uh, I think the only thing that's really CGI is Millennium Tower, which, if you have an eyeball for these things, you can tell. Um... I don't know if they did a soundstage or they just found a, a block of Tokyo that looks like it, but their representation of Kamarocho, very good. Like, you did see the street and you're in... like, yeah, that's Kamarocho. I wonder if they, I wonder where they filmed. I wonder if they, they, they like built a set or if they actually like went to like Kabukicho and filled in some, some areas there. Yeah, like I, I feel like they have to have used a soundstage because it's so accurate, but it may just be that those streets in, in the actual Kabukicho are just so good that, like, Kamurocho looked like that anyway, but, like I said, the, you can tell when they do the zoomed-out shots in 2005 that, like, the Millennium Tower is, like, drawn in with CG. <laughs> it's not uh. there. Um, but, you know, the, some things you can't help, but like I said, so, like, it seems like a minimal SFX budget, and they actually have some amount of, you know, guns with some with some squibs and stuff, you know, I, I think they've actually, like like, done a little practical effect so, like, I, I respect that sometimes the choreography is not too, like, gritty, but there are definitely some times where, like, you know, Kiryu hits a guy with an uppercut, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's, you know, <laughs> flops over, you know, stuff like that. So, like, the the fights aren't necessarily sold, like, as hard as they could all the time, but they still manage to pepper in some of the character you might expect from this sort of a thing. Like, it's, like I said, it's really interesting. They capture the effect of, Kiryu can't walk five feet without getting into a fight, right? Like, they just <laughs> do these kinds of montages. Like, literally, man gets out of prison, a bunch of goons waiting for him. Hired goons here. Um, And in that fight, he does a very, like, Kiryu part of the choreography, where he, like, slams a guy's head against a wall, like a cinder brick wall, and then scrapes his head against it, which I think is a heat action in one of the games. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like, and you're like, yeah, that's right. Um... And then when he goes to Kamurocho and he picks up his new suit, you know, some guys are, like, picking off in the dre- dressing booth. They're like, hey, man, are you busy? And he's like, I'm making a very important decision in my life. And they're like, huh? What if I correct? He just beats the shit out of two guys in the store and walks out, you know? Like, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, no, this tracks. Um, So, like, it does capture some very Yakuza-type feels. Um, And I will say that, like, if you're looking for the the levity you get, with side stories and side activities, they don't really hit that. Um, it feels much more like a conventional J drama in that way. Like it's still the plot points and the plot structure still very much in tone with the Yakuza games, but we do lose some of the levity for the sake of that. They still do these things. Like there's still mention there's a manga cafe that's a major background element in some of those in some of those uh, first three episode scenes. Like our our setup scene is. And this is the intro scene, so it's not a spoiler to say, but their introductory scene is actually very interesting. They do have subtitles for all the characters, like they do the big big title cards, which is good. But they do a heist montage to introduce you to Kiryu, Nishiki, uh, uh, Yumi, and um, Nishiki's sister, uh, Miho. And this is the thing that I know Legendary said in the chat as well. But this is something that's very interesting in that, like, Nishikiyama's sister is, like, a real character. Um... And I do want to say that, like, I do think in Yakuza 1, she was very much not. Like, that was just, like, she was part of Nishiki's backstory. So, like, all of them are set up in this kind of, like, doing a fucking Kamurocho, you know, punk kid heist. And that's how they get in Yakuza trouble. But there's a big shot of that that's, like, at an arcade, you know, uh, at one point Miho's playing games. Uh, at another point, like, just as part of a, a, a montage, um... Nishiki and Kiryu, like, play Shogi, you know? So, like, they have those little touches, um, but they're not perfect. Uh, overall, the show is very interesting. Yeah, um, Legendary said this in chat. They've done something which I think I actually kind of like, which is they basically merged the pre-prison timeline, 1995 years, with 
the stuff in Yakuza 0 that's supposed to take place in the 80s. Um, and that's something I actually think I do like. Like, I, I get that the series, I think, like, likes their 10-year time skips, but, like, the fact that Yakuza 0 happens in the 80s and then the, the lead-up to Yakuza 1 is in, like, 1995 is, like, that's a little weird for me. That's a little weird on the timing. Um, we miss out maybe some of that, like, big 80s energy, which I think was kind of important to the feel of Yakuza 0, but for a, a storyline, like, just putting all the prologue stuff in one, you know, block of years is pretty good. And I do think I, I like how uh, the show is constantly doing flashbacks. They have a little, a little like, screen tag where they'll, like, show the year and then they'll, like, Rolodex it back or forward, right? Um, and they even do this to show, like, stuff from, like, even further in, like, um, Yumi and her sister's backstory, you know? Like, then they do flashback to, like, the 80s for a couple of things, you know? Um, so, like... It's really well put together. These are really good scenes, and they're they're doing a lot of fun character stuff. Of like, like I I actually recently I've, I've started rewatching a highlights of of Yakuza One Kiwami Edition, and like obviously we do a really good job of building up Nishiki like in the prologue. But like once we flash forward to two thousand five, like I feel like he immediately becomes the final boss character, right? Mm-hmm. And just kind of like lurks off screen. Um, in the show, no, they don't do that. They get they actually like. He's a he's a major supporting character, so like Nishiki actually gets scenes with like other characters and like gets opportunities to like talk with Kiryu that are not like immediately like antagonistic, right? So like really keeping that brothers theme together. Um I will say another thing, like I said, if you're a purist, um they seem to have for characters for the most part casted more for ability rather than appearance. Uh like all of our core characters do a pretty good job of looking at like like when when they're in 1995 uh Nishikiyama's actor doesn't look a lot like like past Nishikiyama but like when he's in 2005 and he's got his like hair slicked back I'm like yeah that's Nishiki that that tracks you know for for being a younger Kiryu the actor they've got for Kiryu looks pretty good Yumi looks pretty good and stuff um I think they've even got a decent uh actor for like uh uh Kiryu's adopted father old man Kazuma um but like a lot of the other oh and um I should say this uh uh, the guys they've gotten for uh, Majima, and there is a little uh, Saijima as well in the in the flashback uh, years. Uh, those guys are looking pretty good. Um, we've only gotten a little, a little bit of Majima in the first three episodes, but he he's doing a pretty good job with that. Um, but like the the Yakuza head honchos they've got going on, um, despite the fact that a lot of those guys are um, stunt casted, like in the games, like they're literally using Japanese like actors' faces. Um, they've picked actors that don't look uh, like a lot of them, like, um, uh, Dojima is just, you know, kind of a, you know, not, not quite as, as, as squat and rounded as Dojima is in the games. Um, uh, Shimano is just a guy as opposed to the guy he is in the games, which is this fucking bald ass, giant ass, tiger back guy. Like, basically, the, the characters in the Yakuza TV series are built like actual Yakuza members from the year 2005. They are not built like they need to be able to rip off their shirt and do a boss fight at any given time. <laughs> so, like, they're built like normal people, you know. So, that's okay. I don't mind that. That does make it a little weird for me as a guy who's, like, played some of the games and seen a lot of people play those games and talk about them where I'm, like, you'll I'll hear an offhanded where, like, they talk about, like, Shimano and I'm just like, that guy's Shimano? He just, he's just a guy, you know? Um, and, like, I had to, like, check the Amazon facts for, like, who the head of the Tojo is supposed to be because I think it's still the character of Sera, but he doesn't look anything like him in the games, you know? So, like, there's a little bit of disconnect there. But other than that, like, the the plot stuff they do is still really good. Like, they've they've done a very good job of, like, weaving in, you know, our we've got our core three characters in... Uh, Nishikiyama, Yumi, and, and Kiryu. We split the the camera pretty evenly between all of them, um, and kind of moving back and forth. That's another thing that they do that's different, but I like, which is like, you know, one one of the big plot hooks of Ka- uh, Yakuza One is that Yumi is just missing. Um, they don't do that part yet, at least. I don't know if they will, but like the they they kind of like because they've they've you know compressed everybody's ages. They've kind of like moved some of that onto Yumi's older sister, who is mentioned and a part of Yakuza 1, but is very much a non-character. He or she actually, like, has some bits. Uh, and they have some new stuff. They've they've started talking about, like, this this demon of Shibuya... Uh, of Sh- yeah, I think it's Shibuya stuff, like, carving satanic symbols into guys. Um, 
that to me almost feels like they're like decided to borrow some tropes from like judgment like you know not quite mogada type stuff the mole but like in that vein i also kind of feel like they decided to do that as kind of a stand-in for a lot of the korean and chinese mafia stuff um which i like i don't know what japan's current politics are but like that's a major part of a lot of the yakuza games is that usually you will stumble into you know uh Shanghai Mafia or Korean Mafia type stuff like oh, where they overlap with the Yakuza. I haven't seen any of that in the series, so I don't know if they're like doing the the you know weird masked hoodie guys as like a a cover for that or you know what. But that is technically new and is interesting what they got going on. Um, but like the action flows pretty well. There are still lighthearted moments, like I said before, that it starts with that heist scene. So like in it, um, you know, we've got uh, Yishikiyama's like dressed up like a, a cop, so he goes to like you know steal a rice cooker full of ca- dirty cash, right? And then the real cop comes back and, like, there's a little moment of, like, he's firing a shotgun while Nishikiyama's dodging and all the time Nishikiyama's just saying, like, how do you have that, man? Where'd you get that? That's not okay. How do you have this? <laughs> and the cop just, the dirty cop just says, it's Kamurocho, baby. And I'm just like, yeah, that's correct. You know, like, a decent number of people have guns, but they do still at least comment that, like, you're not supposed to have guns. And sometimes they're like, you know, crappy, like 38 revolvers and stuff, right? Like nobody's out here pulling out double Uzis yet or anything. Uh, so like it, it goes together pretty well. I think I've got a pretty decent grasp on the characters. They do a lot of like weaving of different story stuff. And like I said, it is it is interesting. You know, they do pretty well with the, the 45-ish minutes of episode they've got. Uh, it does kind of make me sad that they've only got six because I, I think the creative team behind this series has like, a lot of really good chops like there's definitely like i think a core good show in there like i said the, the tone and the presentation is a little different from the games but you know there'd be no point if it was a one-to-one you can uh go and play you know yakuza one kiwami anytime i think it's like bundled on ps plus a couple of times you know um literally i think there's a yakuza franchise sale on steam where everything is like 50 percent off so like if you want to play the games you can just play the games you know so I think the TV adaptation is doing doing very good, uh, and I recommend to check it out. Like I said, I'm very interested to see what they do with their remaining three episodes, because, like, they're doing a pretty good job of, like, a slow build to, like, both how cute you got in prison. That That isn't in the show. Like, obviously, we can assume because we know the game plot, but, like, in the show, they have not explicitly spelled out. They imply very heavily that he is his responsible for the the death of, you know, boss dojima um they use the phrase oyagoroshi a lot which the subtitles don't translate but i assume means basically like you know like oyabun killer like like you know or 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 family killer um but like they don't explicitly go out and say it so like they're they're like like i said they're weaving the narratives of like the 1995 flashback stuff like keeps going past the first episode so i'll I'll be very interested to see how the how the two timelines you know uh shake out and like I said, they they do homages to the other stuff. Like a big part of Yumi and Miho's sideline is like they, as a result of this, you know, cash heist they do in the beginning. Like um, they end up working as hostesses at Serena, you know. So like <laughs> you effectively get like a snapshot of like the cabaret or hostess mini games, but serious. Like there's even a scene where there is like a big oil baron type guy, you know, pouring. Uh, champagne into a pyramid of champagne glasses you know that kind of stuff so like they have these little homages they don't really focus on it but they put them in like montages and background scenes um and they do a very good job of like their their different you know sets and stuff and and like i said i'm i'm very interested and i will say the one character who they managed to make look v- pretty much like his video game part was the florist of sai like like i was like you see him in like a flashback he actually gets like a little bit of backstory a little bit of setup and then you go to like the underground base with all the TV screens, and yeah, I'm gonna be like, especially because, like I said, a lot of the other guys don't look anything like their game characters. I'm like, okay, how's he gonna look? No, he's he's fucking there. He's belly out, you know, in the robe, got the fucking headband all that. I'm like, damn, no, that guy's killing it. He's living his best life. Like he looks the part. Uh, so yeah, like I said, v- very interested to see what they do with with three more episodes, and I'm kind of curious if this uh, TV series could get you know more seasons and maybe adapt uh, future plot stuff you know like like would they be willing to go through future games worth of story or even like touch on side story shit you know like i said i don't i don't you know 
need Kiryu to sit down and like have a whole 45 minute episode devoted to Pocket Circuit Fighter. But like I'm I this show feels like it's the kind of thing where like if you're paying attention, I would see a a, a like a Pocket Circuit Fighter or a Messu King like ad in the background or like it would be part of another thing where like Kiryu finds like one of those like hostess cards or the Messu King cards on the floor and just be like, huh, weird, puts it in his pocket goes back to, like, chasing a guy or beating up guys. Like, they do their little touches, but they keep their tone very consistent, which, like I said, it's interesting. It's not bad. It's different, but I like it. And I'm very, I very much want to see what they got going on there. And like I said, the, their, you know, Majima hasn't gone full, full Majima yet, so I'm like, I, I, I do want to see that guy, because he's pretty good at it, and I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to hear the Kiryu chant. I want to see the full part. If they could, you know, have him try and jump Kiryu out of a giant traffic cone, I think that could still work, you know? because <laughs> cause he's still portrayed as like you know a crazy guy so yeah no it's it's good and that's my two uh, I had a note here to maybe talk about some space trucking but we're almost at three hours so I just want to I do want to wrap up like I said I'm getting a little dry throated I'm a little a little lightheaded and need to hydrate Lucky probably needs to hydrate I've got something to drink but if you're if you're done you're done yeah um, space trucking is trucking along though we've kind of pivoted to some some uh, more mechanic stuff I'm slowly working my way through like combat and hazards and healing and asking the guys game design questions. We've, we basically got through character gen, and, and I think uh, a lot of people have, like, taken a look at, at, like, sorting out how that works, and overall, I think all of you uh, feel, like, comfortable with the, the packages and the amount of free XP you get and the traits. Yeah, no, they're fun. So, like, we're... Already these guys, we're probably, like, at, at this rate, we're probably still, like, you know, months away from a space truck and, you know, playtest campaign or whatever, but, you know... The boys are already whipping up a motley crew of, of spacers to, to come together. I still don't know exactly how we're going to come together. We'll, we'll figure it out. It doesn't always make sense, but we'll, we'll, we, we will work it out, I'm sure. And, and we've got room to come together. Um, and if you have been missing Rain, Rain will be back. We did, rec- we did record a new session. I'm sure we'll be back for another session on Sunday. That reminds me, I've got to make sure my notes are up to snuff. I was planning on doing it yesterday, but like I said, the movers were here and we got a lot of stuff moved in. So we were busy with other stuff, but I gotta make sure. Uh, both those episodes are uploaded. I will give them thumbnails and titles and descriptions and stuff and, and ship them out uh, back-to-back probably Sunday. Yeah. Just dump them all out so you can get a super big, long rain inning. Yeah, so we had a lot of a lot of good rain uh, stuff come out. And honestly, I think our next episode, we're probably going to take take a pretty good pace. My plan is to have the, like, fully have the events for the last two days of the festival blocked out and then... I guess leave some wiggle room for like introducing some new plots, bringing up some stuff and letting you guys set up for, you know, how exactly you want to handle uh, your possible uh, visitation on, you know, the the tour. Yeah. Whether it's a royal tour or a grand tour or whatever. Um, and leave, I got to leave you some space for your ice, ice cream social as well. Yeah. But yeah, so we'll, we'll wrap up there. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, sorry about the slight hiccup there, but you know, it, it happened how it happened and we hope you enjoy it. Uh, like I said, it'll probably still be a while of some soupy or streams. Like I said, because I don't, I don't have a, a an appropriate Ethernet cable to to start wiring in my PC just yet, and I don't know when we'll get to it. So stuff may be a little a little silly for a little bit, but I'll I'll still try and hit some of our regular streams. You know, we'll we'll try and get in on some some fourteen, and then try some Yugen and stuff, and and maybe we'll hit up a. A blah 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 Astrobot. Or I could just stream Bellatro runs for like two hours. That you guys won't care if those those are slow. <laughs> just me making making poker hands and cursing God. Anyway, we're gonna do our little outro. Like this video on YouTube, leave your comments. I'm sure I had several comment moments you should commentify down there. Many thoughts you can give us. Uh ring the bell if you haven't already and make sure you're subscribed to the channel to get more videos and streams. Consider joining our Discord, it's a fun time, you can hang out. And I would like to use this opportunity now to mention that you can support us on Patreon, uh, get episode to the episodes in audio format a little bit early, uh, get access to topic polls and other stuff. And at our highest level of Patreons, you can listen to the episode live every week. That's the chat I refer to when I talk about the patron chat. And if you uh, offer our tippy toppest tier, you can get a little shout out like Adam DeHart, Blacklist OG, Call Me Zed, Carlos, Dragon, JDV 9000, Justin the Fay. Kaiser, Chris Starlight, Legendary Boss Hunter, Liam Kessler, Rise of Kenji, Rogue Robin, Trevor, some guy named Bob and Varian the Crow. Thank you very much for your support, patrons, and thank you for everybody for consuming the content all the way through to the end. Uh, let me know what you think about putting the Patreon bump at the back. 
And that's everything I got to say this week. So that's going to be uh, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>